request the gathering to kindly be seated. Once the session is in progress, I kindly request everyone to kindly put your cell phones on silent mode. I repeat, I request everyone to kindly put your cell phones on silent mode. Once the session is in progress, I request everyone to kindly avoid walking through the front passage. I repeat, once the session is in progress, I request everyone to kindly avoid walking through the front passage. Thank you. Very good morning to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, dignitaries, guests, and participants. Welcome back to the second day of ICAP 2023. For the first invited talk of the day, we have Dr. Devosis Day, a professor from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad University of Technology, West Bengal. He received his MTech degree from the University of Calcutta in 2002 and a PhD from Jadavpur University in 2005. He received the Young Science Award both in 2005 and in Delhi and in 2011 in Istanbul, Turkey from the International Union of Radio Science, Belgium. In 2019, he received Shiksha Ratna Award from the Government of West Bengal he is Vice Chair of Duke Computing STC of the IEEE Computer Society. He has published papers in 360 journals and 200 conferences, 15 books and 5 10 patents. Listed in the top 2 person scientists of the world, Stanford University, USA. His research interest lies in the areas of mobile cloud computing, IoT and quantum computing. I request sir to kindly take the stage. Very good morning. Good morning, sir. So today I am just going to talk about uh, this uh, Internet of Drone things. Actually, uh, many of you know what is IoT, which is called Internet of Things, right? Now, this uh, the term drone is coming in between. Okay, so we call it uh, Internet of Drones or Internet of Drone Things, where you can see this all the drones flying on the sky; they're all connected. So today, I'll just try to explain the technology behind this connectivities which is related to your conference theme of communication and computing. So both the things will be happening together, right? So I'll try to give some of the basic features and highlight some of the applications of this IODG, Internet of Drone Things, right? And you know that uh, for last uh, few decades, these drones are part of our life. Every application in our day-to-day -day life, you know, this drone is part. Now, these drones are all connected to internet. And multiple drones, they are coordinating. See, they need to coordinate, right? For example, in this conference, I have seen some of the team is managing the, you know, this uh, hall, someone is, someone is working on the dais, someone is managing the guest house, someone is managing the uh, transport. So, all need a coordination, isn't it? If you do not have a proper coordination, system will fail. Similarly, to make a proper coordination among these drones, we need to connect them through internet. So internet is a basic important need for this connection of these drones, right? And they are working it together for certain uh, applications or certain uh, systems, right? So today I will just discuss some of the applications how these drones are connected and what are the future prospects of these drones, right? 
Now, before I start, that we have a center of mobile cloud computing where actually we work uh, on the mobile data, anything which has mobility. Any objects, your mobile phone, or you are using mobile phone as mobility, we are all connected to the cloud, right? And uh, nowadays everything is happening through the apps, isn't it? Everyone knows it, right? So, your mobile phone has hundreds of, of apps. You can download it from your app store or anywhere, Google Play Store. And this, you know, through the cloud, we are accessing the various vehicles, all the services we are getting, right? So, Ola and Uber service, you are getting a transportation service. And all this ecosystem we are calling mobile cloud company, mobile to cloud. What is the connectivity? Through apps. Agreed? We are all using it day to day applications. Now, the question is when the mobility comes, then the challenges comes. And there is an advantage, right? Why there is no, uh, you know, the landfall are getting exhausted because, you know, that landfall do not have the mobility. So, wireless is the future. So, we are connecting all the objects and uh, there are certain challenges also. So, we work on the data mobility, mobility of the data. Data is also moving. Isn't it? And also vehicular data. See, lots of cars, connected cars, EVs, they are coming. So, they are called vehicular mobility. And crowd sensing. Means your mobile phone, through your mobile phone, we can sense what is the temperature of this uh, Sikkim or Rongo over here. We don't need any thermometer to put nowadays, right? Everyone's mobile phone is sensor. If you have a central server, we can connect your mobile phone and we can get to know what is the temperature in every area. Okay. No need to put any physical sensors because everyone is using mobile phone. <coughs> and their data is always already you are all connected to internet, isn't it? We don't um, hardly switch off our our internet connections, right? Always we are connected. We are always connected to the cloud. Even we can see, we can download the movies and everything through YouTube. No need to store in your, uh, in earlier days we have a habit of storing of uh, music and so and so. Nowadays every time you want to play any music, you can put this to right? Or YouTube. So, mobile crowd sensing is playing a major role. Even through these drones also, I'll show you how the drones are actually sensing the whole area and they are getting the information without installing the physical sensors. So, they are utilizing the capability of your mobile phone and they are connecting the data to the cloud. So, this is known as mobile crowd sensing. Crowd means to understand. So, people, we are connecting the people and we are connecting the data to the cloud. So, we, this cloud has all the information of everyone's information. Your paths, patterns, mobility, everything. And to the cloud, you know that uh, they can, this cloud, you know, you can get the information, not only the temperature. Say someone is uh, moving from one place to other place, they are getting the path location, where the data is going. So, mobility management is very, very important, which is possible through this mobile cloud sensing application. And also this uh, mobility analytics, smart city mobility. Now that uh, we call it smart city. Smart city means what is the definition of smart city? The city which has uh, one of the parameters is mobility. There are a lot of other parameters. One of the parameters is mobility. If you ask, say, city A, any city, Bengaluru, Calcutta, or Sikkim here also, if you say the mobility, the mobility of the average mobility of the car is high. Then we can say the that city A is better. The average uh, mobility of Shanghai is say 65, or some city is 55. So which one is better? So we are getting all this kind of information, all this mobility informations, and we are measuring the smartness of the city. We are measuring the smartness of the locality through this crowd sensing applications. And drones are playing a major role to capture the data from various locations. Okay. <coughs> so, 
these are the very interesting applications we do. We measure the mobility patterns as well as the average speed of the vehicles. Because you know that nowadays most of the vehicles are coming as a connected vehicles. Vehicles are all connected. If you see the modern cars, they were all IoT. We call it Internet of Vehicular Things. Earlier, just wait. Two, three years, all cars will be connected. You can also see how much fuel is there, which is the nearest petrol pump. You know, everything will be connected. You are getting all the information. So, car will dictate you where to refuel your, you know, this car. So, this is the very interesting applications that are coming up for the smart city applications. And uh, this mobility management is performed using this uh, your well-known algorithm called PSO. Everyone know particle swarm optimization. We also work on GSO, low warm swarm optimization. These are all the optimization techniques. You know, computer science people, you know, this this optimization techniques are used for better mobility management. Right? Whether it's drone, whether it's VTL, or anything. So ultimate goal is to this full cycle is nothing but mobile cloud computing. Cloud to mobile. Right? So this is a book on CRC, we did in uh, 2015. So where we have shown how this data is offloaded. Offload means we are transferring the data from your mobile to cloud. This technique is known as offloading. And especially during this vehicular communication or this drone community, they, are, they capture the data and they send the data to the cloud. So this process is known as offloading. Okay. Now the question is, uh, cloud computing is almost 20-30 uh, years old. Right? I think your VTEC also have paper on cloud computing, right? Now, the, what is the problem of cloud computing? Cloud computing problem is uh, the servers. Cloud is nothing but servers, right? For example, uh, any cloud you know? Amazon cloud? Yes. AWS, yes. Microsoft Azure, HP Area, and so many clouds. Google also has cloud. So, uh, here in, we are in Chicken, right? Any cloud is here, cloud data center is here? <coughs> no. Amazon cloud is maybe in uh, Bangalore or maybe in Maharashtra, right? Those are working on AWS. <coughs> so just listen. So if you want flying a drone here and data is going to the cloud in Maharashtra and data is coming back, so how much communication cost is there? You know, transmission cost through the internet, it will take several uh, seconds of time, right? Data will be offloaded to the nearest server, whether it is Geo or Airtel or any network, many mobile uh, wireless network, through which you will be connected to the cloud server long distance, <coughs> right? And again, you will come back. So lots of communication cost as well as computing cost. So cost will be high. To reduce this cost, now people are using this word, word called edge computing. <laughs> the edge computing is, uh, even it is also 7 8 years old technology. Where actually we are computing everything on the edge. Your mobile phone is also acting as an edge device. See, 16 GB RAM, my mobile phone has 16 GB RAM, 8 GB RAM, right? Isn't it? It's possible to compute many things locally. <laughs> If you can solve the problems locally, why you go to the cloud again, right? For example, in your college or university, we have a system, right? We have HODs, you know, teachers, HODs, directors, deans, and so you know, so, so structure is there. If HOD can solve it, the problem will not go to director because director will be overloaded, isn't it? Similarly, we should not overload the cloud. If we can solve this problem locally. Then what is the advantage? Communication cost should be reduced, number one. Then computing cost should be reduced, locally computing. And it is real time. Most important term is real time. So drones are mostly used for real time applications, for disaster management, for any real time traffic management, signaling management. So if we the demand is locally management. So edge computing 
or rather mobile edge computing is playing a major role for the purpose of computing and communication cost. See the theme of your conference. Communication and computing, both the costs are reduced. Cost reduction is very important, right? End of the day, every process has a business. So business cost reduction is very important. At the same time, it is real time. So both benefits we are getting when we are operating this system in a edge device, right? So the I think hundred uh, people who are sitting in this room, they have everyone has your laptop or mobile phones. So any sensing, anything, any temperature you are sensing, or anything you are sensing, or this video you are capturing, so you'll be capturing and you are processing in your mobile phone itself. No need to go to the cloud. Why? <coughs> cloud is powerful. We'll go to the powerful, you know, director of an institute or vice president. They are more powerful. But we should not overload them. So we need to distribute. This distribution of load is called load balancing system. So edge computing helps in load balancing. Because see number of edge devices in billions. Millions of edge devices, right? And see, th only thousands of clouds. Only few hundred devices are in India, right? But if you ask uh, number of HODs, maybe 20,000, 30,000, maybe more than that, 50,000. So many departments have been, right? So, similarly, India is a country of 140 crore people, right? So, almost everyone is mobile phone, almost. At least 100 crore mobile phones are there. And see how much jobs we can perform within your mobile phone itself. No need to go outside, no need to go to the top level. So, that is the beauty of computing at the edge. And that is the demand of present day communication and computing, right? <coughs> now, in between cloud and edge, there is something is called form. We call it also form computing. What is that? If the data, say this lecture will be for one hour, right? Say maybe your mobile phone has, do not have that, uh, you know, that memory, then what will happen? You can store the data from your mobile phone so it means offload your data, you capture it and offload your data to the local servers of SMA. Yeah, server memory. So you are storing it to an intermediate server, which is not the cloud, which is the local server of your college or university. Right? So this is known as fog computing. So if the load is less, then you will perform at the edge. If the load is moderate, you will perform at the Level. If the load is very high, we call it big data, petabyte data, then we will go to cloud. So this is the basic concept of this three layer architecture, cloud for getting it. Clear? Now these drones, we are talking about IoT, drones are nothing but edge devices. And drones, you know, we developed the drones, uh, earlier it was uh, hard drives, so now we are using SSG, lightweight, you know, everyone knows SSG. We are connecting the SSD devices and we are uh, fabricating the drones using these 3D printers. Right? I think your, I think your college has. So every, every college is now having 3D printers. Only some electronic gadgets you have to uh, procure or Arduino, this IoT devices are there and some autopilot units. So you can easily make a drone here in your college. So every student, computer science, electronics, they can develop a drone in your laboratory itself. And cost is only thousand rupees or maybe extra two thousand rupees. Okay? And you can connect multiple drones through the IoT, you know, Raspberry Pi, you know, if you want to Raspberry Pi or any IoT device, then we can have a connected network. We call it Internet of Drones. And we can compute the local problems. Say, suppose there is a lecture is happening in parallel sessions, two, three parallel sessions. So, someone is coordinating. And multiple edges, are, multiple drone cameras are there. They are coordinating the full event. So one of the things is called coordinated drone. Other drones are called slave drones. You, you know the you know what about master slave architecture, right? Master slave architecture. We are we can do it in the same for these edge devices, right? So I'll show you. Now in a smart city application, see, uh, we are using various bandwidths, right? Data as bandwidth, right? In a system. We have high, medium, and low bandwidth. 
Now see, the traffic light control, just wait two, three years, there will be no traffic signal systems. So you know, it will be totally controlled by the drone system. And they can see the condition of the road, accordingly they can take a decision. So the control room only, there will be a control room, and the drones will be in the control room, they can control the full traffic conditions, right? Because, what is the advantage? The control room can see all the roads together, and they can take a proper decision centrally. Which side the cars will move, or which side you need to block, something like that. <coughs> in smart road applications and smart healthcare, see uh, the hospitals, especially the hospitals, they have a drone service. You know that? You'll be connected to a hospital, and if you have minor problems, the number of doctors still in India is also less. All over the world, it is less. So for minor problem, you know, you can see the drones will be coming. They will be taking your health parameters. They will make a survey, or the camera will come. The doctors or the health giver, service givers, they will consult you. So the drone will come from certain hospital where you are registered, and they can give a home service, home doctor. That is actually it is happening. If you go to YouTube, you will see lots of this kind of videos are there. See, one doctor has to travel so many places, they cannot give service, but from a hospital, he can monitor at least 10 patients together. So by this process, they are giving very good uh, services. But if the patient is serious, then they will send an ambulance or something like that. So I will show you in details how this uh, healthcare uh, is given by these uh, drones. Even, you know, there is uh, delivery systems, you know, the this uh, mail delivery, even the, you know, the medicine delivery. You know that, uh, like a pizza, you know that? What uh, pizza says that it will deliver within 30 minutes or something like that. Otherwise, it is free, something like that. So, what we, is actually happening, we can see this, you know, drones will deliver the medicines, and uh, I was talking to Flipkart people, they are also thinking to deliver the products at your. Uh, home, door-to-door -door delivery to the drones itself. Even uh, during this COVID, the vaccine delivery is done by the drones itself. Everyone knows that. In the remote places, in the hills and some of the islands, where it's very difficult to go, so drones are doing the delivery. So, so much services we are getting. Even some of the power grids, if there is a power failure, this uh, high bandwidth drones are giving power services. Not, not, no load shedding, no power cut. So power drones are also giving services. So, so much applications are coming up. And listen, these drones, A to B to C, they are all connected through internet. If one drone fails, then other can give the support as a replacement. Right? If one of the drones battery goes down, other will come as a replacement. Just like you have seen the football match. Have you seen football match? FIFA match? You days before, few months before, right? So you have seen the coaches changes the player after why they change? Because see the performance is going down for the players or not performing according to the demand or exhausted. They change the what players as a replacement. Similarly, so when the drones are connected together, if one drone battery is down, other drone can take the place as a replacement. Clear? And that is the beauty of Internet of Thrones. So connected. Connection is very important. Now the question is, uh, learning in the air. Drones are actually learning in the air. There is a famous movie, Love is in the air. So I thought, why not learning in the air? Learning means, drones are learning, you know that, for last one year, we are just simply learning machine learning everywhere, right? CNN, deep learning, all the papers are like this. So, these drones are moving on the sky and they are learning. What they are learning? They are learning the patterns of the user. They are learning the, you know, the how this, how they have to move. Coordinated movement. Why coordinated? If the drones will move in a random fashion and there will be a lot of collision and drones will, you know, collide and lot of loss of drones. This is not possible. 
This is not allowed, right? So they are learning at the age level. See, those are age, age competing, agreed? Those are performing at the age, and those are having SSG drives. And SSG, you know that computing capability is high, right? So we are computing at the age, and we are learning in the age. Learning is happening in the age. So learning in the year, that means loans are learning when the jewels are on the year itself. Okay? So very interesting techniques are there. Uh, again, it is a machine learning techniques we are using for federal learning, is how we call it. I'll show you later. So this uh, intelligence, we have to give the intelligence to the jewels. Intelligence, what kind of intelligence? How to capture? Where to capture and how to gather it. When, whether to offload or not to offload. Very important. Whether you have to offload or not to offload. And it must have the intelligence. So it is a confluence of AI and mobile edge computing. So two technologies involved. I already discussed about edge computing and this is mobile edge computing. Means edge computing in mobility. There are a lot of challenges involved. And this AI is coming into the picture. Now, what is mobile edge? You know, it's, uh, some definition is there. Multi access edge computing or mobile edge computing, <coughs> ETSI definition is that enables the cloud computing capabilities to the edge of the device. Right? What is the, what is the advantage? <coughs> One is latency. Low latency, latency means delay, right? Low latency and high computing, high end computing at the edge level. So these are the two important aspects of mobile edge computing. So, so we have written two books on uh, this mobile edge computing, which was published uh, this year. One is on uh, mobile edge computing. If you are interested, I can give it to anyone. So it's published by Springer. Where we are, this is 22 chapters where I will discuss the mobility related problems. When the mobility is there, what are the challenges are faced by the drones and how to resolve it. And what kind of machine learning we have to do? This is another one AI for IoT. The drones are nothing but IoT devices. So, anyone is interested, they can go through it. In details, we have given the data. Okay, so we have discussed about the intelligence. See, there are three levels of intelligence, right? First level intelligence is the lower layer. You, are, you heard about YOLO, right? Everyone know YOLO. YOLO is a very important program of computer vision, right? You heard about YOLO light. Anyone? Eurolite. Eurolite, what is the purpose of Eurolite? To, you know, Eurolite is used for the devices, edge devices, where the computing capabilities comparatively less compared to the cloud, level, right? So, the edge devices we are installing, this is very important. When you are writing any machine learning codes, you have to see the computing capability of the devices. We cannot give heavy codes. So, it is lightweight. Uh, machine learning techniques or uh, just sim similar to Eurolite, we are giving it to the terminal. So this this intelligence at the local level or in the car or in drones or in the vehicles is called terminal intelligence. So in the mid in between on the servers we have local intelligence and the cloud level we have centralized intelligence. So intelligence level is divided in a cloud for edge platform in three levels. Okay. Why? Because if you have to take a decision, machine learning is it take, gives a decision, recommendation system, right? It recommends something. So you have to take the decision locally. I actually can take a decision locally, right? Whether they will allow your student to, or not, whether uh, they will cancel the exam copy or not during copy, right? So so many decisions you have to take. So this intelligence is coming into the drone level. So it's called yeah, if the drones have to take a decision from the cloud, what will happen? Drones will collide or the incident will happen or car will collide, you know, this totally mess. So as a result, you can see we have three levels of intelligence. 
local intelligence, middle is uh, top is centralized intelligence, right? Now, 5G and 6G, you know, 5G is already knocking at the door, although the 5G carrier is not available, right? Many but still, 5G and 6G network is coming up for ultra high speed drone computing, right? There is a famous song, you know, who is the singer? Yesterday it was a very good uh, function. She like it, yes. That means the part can fly autonomously. Whether you are saying bird will you have to fly? You have to say you are giving an uh, order, yes or no? No, right? If bird sees something, bird can fly. Similarly, uh, you heard about autonomous drones. Autonomous drones means drones they can fly by themselves. So they can take their own decision. What is this? Age intelligence. Agree? Now the question is, say suppose you have an intelligent drone which can see two person is lying on the floor on a, on a road. So what they will do through this edge computing, they will give our instruction to this uh, so many neural networks or whatever to the control room that two person is uh, you know, on the floor, they must send an ambulance kind of thing, right? So no need uh, any human intervention. We are reducing the human intervention, especially in the remote areas, also in the cities, where immediate attention is required. So, drone will give off instruction to the local hospital, nearest hospital, and uh, they will rescue these two people, two persons, right? Now, if the drone can see the two person is uh, lying on the floor and some fire, then what will happen? Then what will happen? They will give a call to the ambulance, also the fire brigade. See, both it is a part of simple computer vision. So they are capturing the drone, the drone is taking the picture and sending this information to the control room and they are sending the ambulance as well as the fire brigades to stop the fires. Now this is the part of autonomous drones. Drone are, drones are taking their own decision. So, do you have, I think now everyone agree, drone needs the intelligence? Agree or disagree? And it's only possible in your machine learning, your what you call deep learning or transfer learning or whatever, right? So this is very, very important that autonomous drone is a need of the hour, right? Now so much applications of the drones in uh, see so much industries. So I worked with this drone industry called mining industry. We have one project with uh, Professor Jaitu in uh, ISM Dhanbad, we have a project. So, so our drones are working in the underwater drones. No, the mines are, most of them are underwater. So where some toxic gases are there. So we are using these underwater drones as well as the uh, flying drones, means on air drones. And these drones are connected, mining. Underwater drone is also communicating to the surface drones on the air. So it's very interestingly we are communicating. So it is only possible to IoT only. Now the challenge we are facing, real challenge is in the mind, how the internet will go. Internet is not so smooth, right? So internet has a lot of problems. So we devised, we have uh, developed certain solutions for it. So I'll show you. So telecommunication industry insurance, very interesting, insurance industry. They're using these drones for, for certain, say you are have a bridge and drones will make a survey and they can have a, what is called a digital twinning technology, right? You know digital twin? It is a part of your MATLAB system, you know that same Bridge, it's a hard bridge or any bridge or any bridge here, right? So they will move two, three rounds, they can capture the images, you can see much more crack than insurance price will hide. It is not possible by one drone, so multiple drones are required. So what is actually happening? Hundreds of or at least ten drones are moving around the system, they are capturing the data, they are capturing the images, they are founding a 
full bridge you know this digital and they are assessing the strength of the bridge so it is only possible due to this internet of drones right multiple drones are working together to for the assessment so insurance company they are using these drones for various insurance right media entertainment you know this. if you go to any marriage house you know or any conference you see the drones are flying around you so how much coffee you are taking how much chicken ball you are eating everything is captured right drones are moving they are taking a very nice pictures so entertainment industry if you go to see which hundreds of drones are flying you know they are booking youtube what is called blog right they are earning money also so drones can use in lot of things for uh, this entertainment industry security and border security right i think if you know that border security is one of the major challenge and our soldiers are on the minus temperature and so obviously drones are unmanned drones are there and they have no problem they fly on the system in the 24 by 7 basis and as a result we are getting this security but can you believe it biggest biggest advantage we are in india at least in agriculture I am working with a company which has uh, at least you know several thousands of crores of rupees they are doing business. And what is the purpose? You know, this drones company they are talking to the farmers and they are asking how much fertilizer required, how much uh, you know they have. A, we have a team. We have a meeting. If anyone wants to join our team, we can join. So they are working in our team meeting, and we have a scientist, we have an economist. and agriculture industry they are working together for a better production of the crops and if you have buy a drone for your uh, say paddy field or any field crop area you can have a at least 25% increase of profit why because two advantage the manpower is reduced number two is the exactly you have to pinpoint that why is a pesticide is required If you put pesticide to a uh, unaffected area also, it will be a loss. Right? Drones are going to that area, making a survey, aerial survey, and the uh, area is affected. Then you pesticide to that area. So agricultural industry is growing like anything, also the infrastructure. So and all every process, you know, see this drones, see multiple drones are working together to all these agricultural purposes. And uh, we have a statistics database, very interesting database, all over India. That uh, what is the crop size, what is the crop type, and what is the you know they give you recommendation what uh, time you have to grow these crops. So various interesting applications of agri drones are coming up. Agriculture drones playing a major role in our country because you know how much almost seventy percent farmers are here, right? So farming. is a big uh, challenge if you can grow the you know again another big problem we have faced that the challenges you have seen that due to the excessive you know that uh, pesticides the soil uh, quality degrades i think many of you know the soil movement of india right sadguru started right if you see do not see see the we are spoiling our own soil if you are spoiling your own soil with over production or under production you are facing lot of problem so soil management can be done using these drones unbelievable advantage we have got earlier we there was a lot of protest because farmers are telling that we will lose our jobs no it's not like that anyone is interested i can we have a full project on it agree to and you will get lot of subsidy from government anyone has any idea you can Get a lot of funding from government. Now the question is, uh, you know, we know big data, right? So volume, velocity, and variety. These are the three Vs. Now you see, present B, uh, big data that are in ten Vs, twelve Vs to publish the paper in good journal. But basic is three Vs: P, velocity, volume, and variety. So what is this? What is this? It is similar to a drone, right? It is flying like this, lightweight drones. This is only possible because of this SSD device. Have you heard 
Earlier, you know, wire pens when you are putting high density, it becomes printer. Now, SSG is lightweight, two advantages lightweight and more data we can capture. So, drones are now very powerful. Agree? So, if you see, drones are actually capturing all the IoT data. So, can you tell me that whether it is equivalent to this? Agree? Like an elephant is flying. Why elephant? Because elephant has huge no. It's getting capability, you know that mass also, right? Yeah? So it is equivalent, I'm just a you know comic picture. It shows that nowadays drones can do a lot of data. So can you conclude today that drones are like a what is this? The superman. Isn't it? Agree or disagree? And when there's so much, it's one superman. If you have multiple superman like this, you know that we can do magic. Actually, this magic is happening. So, this is my old picture, 2017-18. We are working on UAV AV network. You, we call it, you know, Shargo Matto Pata, means sky, all the earth surface, and also the underwater. So, ultimately, when you want to connect the drones, it should carry the three layers on the sky, on the floor, on the ground, at the center, under the water. So that is the reason. Now we are working on various kinds of drones and various applications. PwC is you know very well known company. They are given a, I took this slide from PwC. They have made a tech forecast few years before that drones see these are the, this should be the features of our uh, internet of drones. Features means the characteristics. What is that? Drones can fly by themselves, means autonomous. Right? <coughs> For last couple of years, we are seeing that autonomous drones are flying. They can crawl, crawl, right? Especially it is used in under water mining, mining industry. They can talk to each other, communicate, means Internet of Things. By the way, they are exchanging the data and they can talk to each other. They can recognize the faces or objects. You know, during this COVID, we have locked down, right? Then 5% is not allowed. If 5% is around on the road corner, drone will go, capture your face, image, and uh, they will send a fine, I want to be signed to your <coughs> card, right? So, face recognition, also criminal recognition, this is a very important use. Also for uh, driving safety, drones are now used for this uh, application. Drones can climb. Drones can climb also. Like a bird, it can climb. They can grab the objects. Like the Flipkart and Amazon, they are trying. <coughs> but still, there is a problem. Have you seen that uh, famous video? That uh, to the bird, you know, there is a coffee delivery, right? Delivery of coffee from one place to another place in Australia, so that's what I can remember. Uh, it was carrying coffee from coffee shop to a person who has ordered and two sudden apps and the birds are attacking because coffee has sudden smells right so we have to think a lot of protections you know this delivery system is there but a lot of challenges are also there so they have done some protection system so that uh, no smell should come out otherwise it will attract the birds and other animals so so much challenges like the delivery system grabbing systems the last point is most important that is what is that? They can give each other space. See, we are all equispaced sitting in this hall, right? Sudden chairs, such demarcations are there. Now, if they can give each other space, <coughs> otherwise, what will happen? It will collide. I told you many times that they will collide. Collision is not allowed, right? So, these are the main seven characteristics uh, coming up. Well, you can see multiple drones. They will connect themselves, but at the same time, they will follow this. Rules, right? So these are the some of the experiments in our lab. So we have battery. I think everyone knows what are the GPS systems and everything. So drone has a sensing capability and communication capability, right? And also intelligent data processing, means decision making, recommendation system, decision making that can be done by the drone itself. So it's supported by H for new data. Or load balancing. I have already discussed. Isn't it? 
and it can go to low altitudes. They especially drones are actually nothing but a sensor. You know sensors. Sensors are nothing but transducer, which converts something to something, right? Non electrical, electrical. So mostly drones are acting as a modern sensors for any city, any city applications, right? This is the evolution of drone. Just a single line, I can say that it was started in <coughs> long time, 1950. There was a balloons or drones. Nowadays, in 2022, whatever it becomes autonomous. They can take their own decision. So it becomes autonomous drones. So edge drone, which is known as autonomous drones. This is the basic skeleton. If anyone want to design using your 3D printer, you can do it. And this is the autopilot unit. You can buy it from market, it's available. Amazon also is available. And this is the total modules of the drones. Yeah, this is very important that in 5G, 6G network, drones are taking a major role for their connectivities as well as flying base stations. You know, drones has battery and battery will exhaust. So there is a flying saucer kind of thing. Flying base stations, drones will be sitting on that and they will take a charge. Just like your mobile phone charging. Have you seen the wireless charger? Anyone seen? The drones will, you know, the base stations will be flying in the sky. 10 drones or 100 drones, they can sit on it and they can charge, then again it will move. So they are flying base stations. Already, already it is developed, already it is done. Not future, it is already done. Now see it is written the smart city applications or smart room applications or smart grid applications. Especially smart grid means if there is a power failure, drones will move to that place. High end power drones are there. Power drones. They can transfer the power. Electrical power. Fine. Uh, also for the hospitals. No? Ambulance. Real time monitoring of the patients from home to hospital. That can be also done. So this is a basic internet of drone architecture. <coughs> Where we can see the below side layer is the edge layer, mid layer is the form layer, and central core is cloud. So first layer is the perception. Perception is sensing. Drones are sensor. Second layer is edge. Already I have said. Gateway is as the third, pop, and then cloud. So this is the basic structure. Already I have discussed many times. Now the challenges. I am not going in detail, just look at it. There is, we have identified, these are the research challenges. One problem can give 100 PhDs. So these are the research challenges like mobility modeling, like uh, network integration, like privacy is very important. <coughs> Security and privacy is very important. <coughs> Drone must be secure enough to provide the privacy in the system. So these are very interesting research problems. So we published this work in called Edge Drone. I told you why we have given the evolutions. How this edge computing, which provides QS. QS means quality of service. You know, we go to why what is QS? Quality of service of a system. If you go to the hotel, we call it uh, three star, four star, five star. What is the difference? Services. Room services, room uh, quality, and everything, right? Like your guest house is five star, right? I was saying that very good arrangement by the organization. So, see, we are getting quality of service, QAS parameters, very important. See, cost will depend on the QS quality, right? MQTT is a protocol, message queuing telemetric transport protocol is very, very important protocol for IoT, Internet of Things, right? Those who are working on IoT, they know. So we are using this for opportunistic IoT applications. Right? So we can go in detail. We, we have developed the multiple drones. We worked in the engineer. So this is the basic background. Multiple drones. So, so advantage of the drone network is we can add, we can add hundreds of drones, thousands of drones. We call it scalability. For example, uh, you know this all has what is the capacity? 120. If the number of participants is more, that is talking about 1,500 capacities there. So based on the demand, right? Based on the demand, we can allocate the room 
or allocate the system. So this is known as scalability. The scalability term is used very much in cloud computing. Scalable means small size to big size. Scalability. So drones layers we can accommodate multiple drones, right? And we are using various protocols <coughs> for systems. Now another problem we face that very interesting problem that the multiple company you have purchased one drone from one company. Another drone from another company. What is the problem? If you go to China, what is the problem? You have to speak in Chinese language, isn't it? Anyone know Chinese language? So, is it a problem or not problem? <coughs> is it? Now the question is, one drone is using MQTT, another drone is using MQTT SL. Two different protocols. So we need a technology called interoperability. I am repeating interoperability, which is very much used for IoT applications. So we need to trust we need a translator, right? Common language, which can convert one language to other language. One protocol. Protocol means the rules and regulations. So these are the prototypes in our laboratory. I am not going into details. MQTT is a Nothing but a broker based service. Broker. Broker is the purpose of broker. They allocate certain services, right? Similarly, we are giving like 3 star, 4 star, 5 star. So it is lowest service is the highest service. So what is that? This infinity broker this is a publisher, this is one drone. And this is a subscriber, another drone. So one drone, when they are connected through internet, they are connected to the broker protocol, fine. And this is the basic publish and subscribe model. Where we can see is acknowledgement, <coughs> act or act messages actually happening. Now, if you want to go for this is QS0, just look at the picture again. When you go for higher service, see more acknowledgements are coming up, right? You are going for better service, best service, QS2, see much more complicated and much more reliable architecture is coming. Reliability is high. <coughs> so there are interesting message transfer protocols are there. So as I have said that uh, there is a publisher drone, there is a master drone, there are here in this picture 1, 2, N. N may be 100, N may be 1000. So one master drone can control 3 drones. 10 drones, 100 drones, 1000 drones is based on the demand requirement, right? So, this is the uh, what is that? MQTT. So, MQTT, what kind of service you want? QS0, QS1, or QS2? Accordingly, they will give the services to various drones. Say, so in a hospital or in a sorry, in a hotel, there are various kinds of customers are there. There is a what is called deluxe room, super deluxe room. VIP room, right? So you can give QS0 service here based on the type of service QS1, QS2, based on the demand actually we will provide. Okay? This publisher drone, when they are connected to internet, we are providing the services to the system. Okay. So these are the connectivities, I am not going into detail. And we need some of the parametric analysis for bandwidth. And these are all practical data. Message transfer, resource allocations, energy. Energy is very important. Because drones, when they are flying, when the energy is exhausted, <coughs> everything is gone. So people are we are now working in the domain called energy harvesting technology. Drones will fly, then the fly, when the drones are flying. Then that mechanical energy will be converted to so the never will pop, never the power will go down. So this kind of energy harvesting drones are coming up. Unbelievable success we are getting. That even a drone uh, sitting idle for say two days, exhausted, power is going down, they will fly. Clear? And they will gain the energy, it becomes hundred percent power, just like our mobile phone charging, then the drone will sit. So energy harvesting technology is one of the emerging research area in the IoT areas. So this is some of the work on uh, drones for 
intelligent load forecasting in the power grids. We worked in 2000 with this one. Where you can see drones are providing the services to the remote areas. We worked in the Sundarban area where we are selling the services and uh, to the various power grids we are giving the services to the remote villages. It's possible. And suppose you are doing a program somewhere in these areas. Okay? There is no electricity. So you can ask 10 power drones to provide temporary electricity for one event, one cultural event or any political rally or any kinds of events, right? So temporary arrangement, next shift arrangement can be done by the power drones also. So these are the, some of the snapshot of our experiment. And uh, this is underwater drones. You can buy it from Amazon, 73,000 rupees something. And this drone will go inside and uh, they can communicate. See, I told you that our, our goal is to connect the sky in some the rear as well as so just imagine what I started saying that uh, learning in the air means when it's on the air but learning under the water also possible both are same <coughs> answer is no very much challenging again it is a very interesting research topic <coughs> so because water has different mu mu means you know mu Different view, permeability or what it's called, right? So water and uh, air is not same. So communication and computing will be totally different. Totally different. I'm not going in detail. We work in this domain. So if you are interested, you can see our paper for underwater drones in 2021. Uh, software defined drones. So software is actually giving intelligence how to control this power, how to control this adaptive communication and computing. Adaptive means same drone. You have seen the James Bond movie? Have you seen anyone? The same car is moving on the flying on the sky, on the yeah, and also going under the water. Same car. But when the car is on flying or on the surface, using different combination of computing. When it is going under the water, then using different kinds of modulation techniques. Mind it, this is very important. We did it, we faced problem, even we cannot communicate. So underwater is different philosophy, different communication, different techniques. So those who are interested, they can go through it. Another very important thing is the blockchain. Now blockchain is, uh, I think Shaddhattu Patel, you know, he was the author of my <coughs> this one. And we worked on this blockchain based IoT, where it's used for internet drones. For example, the border area, suppose Chinmaya has 10 drones. You're flying on the sky. Some it cross border drones coming and they any drones they want to talk to your drones they want to make a friendship but you know blockchain everyone know blockchain blockchain has a hash function right so if blockchain's hash doesn't match the enemy drone you cannot make the friendship that means data can be transferred cannot be transferred so drone chain is very very popular as most of our country border will be governed by these drones so drone chain will be the one of the promising technology for future applications. Okay. And these are all internet of drone applications. Because all connected drones, especially in the border areas. Right? Next is uh, Glowworm. You know Glowworm? Yes. We call it Jonaki, right? So Glowworm is very much used for <coughs> anti-collision. I'm not going into detail, so it is a nature-inspired wireless sensor network. Nature-inspired company. Okay. What is that? Glowworm moving under the caves and I think you have you seen Glowworm on the campus? Yes. Glowworm is around us. But have you seen the philosophy of Glowworm? They never collide. Right? So they never collide. We took the same philosophy of this Glowworm and uh, we mapped with our wireless sensor network. I think perhaps you walk in this wireless sensor network domain actually. So we have mapped the properties of WSN to GSO and we shown we developed the models of the drones and uh, we developed the mobility model. I'm not going in detail. It will take another four hour, four hours time. So, so this mobility models we have developed, what is the purpose? Drones will never collide. So it is self-organized. Self-organized means drones will be self-organized. 
Suppose you are coming to this uh, hall during this lecture. Okay, you are sitting in your various chairs, right? Your name is there. Yes or no? Your name is written on the chair. So you have seen there is a vacancy. According to your adaptability, self-organizing, and you are not asking anyone. You are sitting on your chair. So similarly, roles are doing self-organization. So using this fanet, <coughs> GSO, self-organized architecture is used for DOM applications. So this is the thing where multiple drones are moving using the GSO and other techniques. I'm not going in detail. So they are used for movement score. Movement means what is movement score? Say suppose you are entering from this uh, door, you have seen the nearest door, nearest seat, nearest available vacancy you are sitting there. Isn't it? So we similar same philosophy were considered for using the glow arm. It's called reverse GSO for energy of machine technique. Movement score based limited grid mobility. Why limited? If the drone is moving from one place to that place, actually student has a tendency to see the back page. That is a different issue, but our energy perspective, we should take the nearest one based on the movement score. And accordingly, <coughs> we have to avoid the collision. So we did some of the works on anti-collision in ad hoc form we published. Also for fuzzy logic, using fuzzy logic. Also we can maintain the global movements for this sensor network as well as for the drones. So I'm not going in detail. So speed. Which speed you move? The challenge. What is the idea? See, one of the biggest challenge we are working a project with other countries that that uh, rescue drone. We are developing a rescue drone, and the drone is moving in the sea areas and try, trying to rescue certain people. Rescue the people. The wind is flowing. They cannot reach. So wind speed is very very important. And there is a website called windy.com. You know, everyone knows. So you see the things that wind speed is playing a major role. Agree? You want to spray somewhere, but wind speed spray will go to other fields. So wind speed calculation is very important in aerodynamics. This is part of. So I'm a computer science person, but I'm just also studying aerodynamics. Just for our research work, right? So wind speed, wind direction, patterns, movement, these are all the various conditions for drone mobility optimizations. So in drone uh, used for COVID days, a lot of applications are there. And uh, most important is the lighting, Diwali. We are causing a lot of pollution and swarm drones, these are called swarm drones. You can make a guitar, sitar, and a lot of companies are coming up. I think you know this, uh, you can have a startup also here, isn't it? So, swarm drones, you can make a patterns on the sky, okay? Maybe, maybe uh, next conference you will make a pattern, you can make a logo of, yeah, I cap, you know this, <laughs> conference like this, you know, it's possible. And a lot of people are doing it. And it's totally pollution free, no uh, pollution, right? So. Even in the you know, IPL match also you have seen, also in Olympics you have seen, and a uh, lot of startup companies are coming up. Only 2G mining. So if they are using the 3D lighting systems, and another point I just must mention here before I end, that there is a drone competition, drone uh, drone robotics competition, that we are India is going to drone Olympics, where they are asking the students. I am also part of the team. I can give you the contact details. Yes, it is a part of AICT program. On a short stop, they have started that one. That, uh, that drone dancing system means according to the music, drone will also dance or dance performance. Just like you have seen the yesterday performance, the drones will perform on the stage. And uh, if it is based on the, you know, this beauty and ethics, and it, it will get the judgment, right? Also, the drone uh, speed, how much, uh, there's a category also, 150 gram. Uh, 2 kg, 20 kg. So people are developing these drones and competition is on. Anyone is interested, they can contact me, I will give you the details. And uh, fully funded by government, by government <coughs> opinion. You can go to Olympics, drone Olympics. Okay. This is happening. I have to finish, but uh, I just want to show you that we are using social drones. Social, I have you know? 
Anyone know what is social ID? Social ID means we all connect it socially, right? We have a relationship, father, mother, children, colleagues. We are calling it social ID. How we behave socially? When you be sitting on the chair, based on the person is sitting on the chair, the light will be on and off, whatever. A lot of techniques are there. Social ID goes at every picture. See, we have published one paper called Social Internet of Things. I'm not going in details, you can read it. If you're interested, you can read it. And also very important, interesting, in healthcare, I started. You know that uh, neurological disease, neurological disease. Uh, have you seen that doctors can see based on the uh, what kind of disease you have, based on the walking pattern? They will ask you to walk six feet or from the ten feet, based on the angle you are moving on the stage or some platform. That will show you how this uh, health is affected. So. If you see the health parameters, we call it stride analysis. Okay? Based on the stride analysis, stride means how the person is moving. So one drone will be moving around you. Productive, right? It will move around you and accordingly, you know that that will tell you what kind of disease you have. Okay? So we worked on this that uh, age computing for Stride analysis. See, stride. Stride means leg movement pattern. So doctors can tell you what kind of disease you have. So I told you, madam, that the hospital will send you a drone doctor, and the drone will move around you. They'll ask you to walk, and they can tell you what kind of neurological patterns or what kind of disease you have. So this is actually one work with our hospital, Calcutta Hospital, we did. And uh, motivation is, I have seen in a Journal that based on the walking pattern, the doctors can, neurological doctors especially, they can tell you what kind of disease you have. Okay. You know, we have most of us uh, has different neurological diseases because we are wearing different uh, long shoes. And that is a major problem. Our shoes size are not same. You know, the shoe industry is called now coming in a different way. And if you see the Shoes are coming for different patterns, you know. Even same person, uh, you have in my shoe is uh, tail. Not both are not same. Both legs are not same. It's for 80 percent cases. Can you believe it? So if nowadays if you're going for adaptive shoe. You're going to show shop. You'll give you just like you're taking a dress. Similarly, you have to give a measurement of your uh, footsteps, and that can resolve a lot of diseases. And drones are doing this magic, right? So this is a very important thing, it's called real-time stride analysis and doctors can monitor and there is an intelligence is given in the drone and going to tell you this kind of disease if you are based on your stride analysis, right? Another thing is the uh, drone. I think I have to finish now. Butron is very important that if there is no even internet connectivity, I am repeating, if there is a less internet connectivity, drones can allow you to connect. This technology is known as due company. We publish this work in uh, IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine uh, this <coughs> January. Okay, we call it due drone, due company for internet growth things. Where what is actually happening? We are using a cache memory. In your mobile phone is cache memory. Similarly, drones has cache memory. Cache will store the data. Are you getting a point? Cache will store the data. When the internet connection is uh, lost, it will become bigger, fatter. When the internet connection is uh, restored, then it will release the data. As if there is no internet connection is gone. So this is the beauty of, we are all talking about IoT, right? IoT is not possible without internet. Or if the internet is unstable, whether the IoT is possible? Answer is yes. Only possible if you are using high-end cache memory. Cache of the device is very important. I think when you are buying a mobile phone from a shop, what do you see? What is the hard disk and what is the RAM? But please, this is very important. If you want to have very good uh, connections, internet connections, please see the cache memory. I am not giving the advertisement, but high end mobile phones has higher cache memory. I did the experiment with cache using this mobile edge computing. We have got seamless results because. If an internet connection is lost for 20, 30 seconds or maybe one minute, it can store it. Seamlessly, as if there is no internet connection is gone. 
So if we work on these drones, because see, problem is drones are going in the sky underwater. I told you the communication cost, uh, communication is lost either in the sky or in the underwater. Because on the sky and underwater communication is different. So this due copy, due drone cache is playing a major role. So those who are interested, they can uh, see this, read this paper, or I can give it to you, Mark. So recently we worked in uh, this March we published March is not years ago. We worked on disaster management on drones. Especially we seen that uh, I was in Istanbul, Turkey in 2011, and the uh, buildings are totally exhausted. You can see that we don't know uh, earthquake and so and so. So there are lots of applications coming up for uh, disaster management using drones. And drones are playing a major role for recovery of the people. How you know? They are getting the data from the Twitter. I think everyone got through this news. They are getting the Twitter data kind of thing. They are getting fetching the information that okay, so Mr. Chimoy is in that hospital. Devashi is in this hospital. So they are searching to that uh, hotel or hotel or something somewhere. Whether he is alive or not, or something like that. So Twitter is also having a service, you can see. Many, many applications are coming up, especially for drone-based disaster management. So I think I have to stop here. So I just want to mention that there is a very interesting technique called uh, uh, federated learning. You know, drones are learning. I told you the learning, right? Can I have two minutes time more? Yes. Just two minutes. See, drones are learning at the edge. Say, in this campus of SMID, I have say 10 drones. They are learning at the edge. Say, one drone belongs to Say Chinmay sir, one drone belongs to say uh, Robin Bera sir, one drone belongs to Kalpana sir. Now the question is, everyone drone is learning locally, and ultimately the pattern is going to the SMIT server. Clear? Local learning, local pattern, they are going to the server, and the server is doing the aggregation. Aggregation means they are taking the pictures, they are taking the data, sensing so many things, and this kind of learning technique is known as federated learning or distributed learning. What is the advantage? All the drones are sending, say 100 or 10 drones are sending the data to the server, and the director or the top level of this institute can understand what is actually happening around the campus. But they are not disclosing, drones are not disclosing whose data. So your privacy has been preserved. So this is known as privacy preserving drone. Privacy preserving. This machine learning is known as PPML. Privacy preserving machine learning. Or distributed machine learning. So we are working in this uh, domain where multiple drones they are capturing the picture. But your identity will not be disclosed. But your data will go. Here. Your pattern will go. And this multiple patterns will be combined to a single pattern. It's very very important. So this is known as distributed computing. And who started? This is again, it is started by Google. 2016, this is known as federated learning. One of the, if you see in the research papers, highest cited machine learning technique is federated learning. Okay. Where privacy of every individual will be preserved. And especially for internet or drone applications, this is very important. So there are various techniques to preserve the privacy. Privacy and the training details. So what you can conclude that drone needs intelligence. Agree? Yes, sir. Drone needs machine learning to provide, uh, prevent the privacy. So we need PPML, privacy preserving machine learning. There is a conference. PPML. I was also organizer of the conference. With PPML, privacy preserving machine learning. You can search on Google again. Second, last point is collision free autonomous drones. Drones must be autonomous at the same time, it must be collision free. Okay? Thank you.
Now, we will have a question and answer session. Any student who has a question may raise their hand. Thank you for the meeting for video session, sir. I actually had two questions. One was regarding the stabilization of the drone. Like when you first build a drone, no sir, when it's flying, oftentimes there are like a lot of errors during the stabilization. How can you prevent that? And stabilization of the drone depends upon the weight and the balancing system. That's called uh, balancing of drones. You have to take care of this aerodynamics drones. Especially the wings. You know, drones, two wings move direction, other two wings other direction. To control the drones. The problem is when the wind comes, especially for the low end uh, lightweight drones, the wind speed is more. So you heard about that, uh, what is the formulation for vector formula? Class 12 from college, right? The, see, the water is moving this direction, road is moving that direction, you have to make an angle. Same trajectory angle, you have to vector, vector, vector formulation you have to do. So that it can be, it can go to the proper destination. Otherwise, you send to one destination, you will go to other destination. You have to you have to calculate the uh, wind speed. Wind speed is very important. Um, thank you, sir. And my next question is regarding the camera. Like normally drones have inbuilt cameras, no sir. But otherwise, let's say like let's take an example of an F450 quadcopter. Like what kind of camera would be like more compatible with it, which is known as FPV or cinematic? The camera that I mean, if you see the uh, even in Amazon, the camera drones are available. Okay. So based on your type of uh, image processing you want to do, based on that you have to purchase the camera. For example, I can tell you that we have a uh, surveillance drone. I think some of you are presenting yesterday the change management. I think it's not here. So when you are doing survey based drone application, then there is simple uh, normal camera with high resolution is okay. But if you are using this camera for, for agriculture, you have to use hyper spectral camera or IR camera based on your type of application you have to do. And sir, so for object tracking? Object? Object tracking, like target tracking or something, sir, like waypoint tracking. Yeah, there is waypoint tracking is basically we are using this uh, global minima, global based, so we are using PSO or GSO algorithms for this uh, multiple swarm optimization. So Thank you. Object tracking is very much used for, you know, this, uh, if you see YouTube, there is a very interesting video for object tracking. Where you can see that they are using this, uh, especially for the enemy drones, how to track and how to stop the drones. Uh, if, you, if the drones are coming to, say, nuclear power station, so there is some drone surveillance, drone radar. Uh, I mean, is expert in radar. So you know that drone radars are playing a major role for this. Uh, Stopping the drones to come into military area, other than they will make an attack on the military areas or, or some sensitive areas or to college areas. So that's not allowed. So drone radar system is also coming. Yeah. And a lot of application in military, military application, as you say, the surveillance drones. Any other questions from our listeners? <laughs> Listening from uh, Dr. Dev is quite interesting, exciting to me. Uh, 90 or 95? So 30 years back or 25 yeah. years back, I have seen Devas is working under me <coughs> at CU. Now the change, changeover, a digital changeover is noticed. So that junior Devas is work under me. Okay, for this project, now see. So I'm really exciting with this kind of presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, please keep it up. Thank you, Uh, this was very interesting talk. In fact, uh, 
I'm sure uh, this is going to open a lot of uh, avenues and a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of ideas on developing uh, projects or uh, you know maybe integrating few things or working on few areas. So this was thank you very much. This was a new opener for especially for the undergraduate students. They have been working on IOTs, but Internet of Drone things. And with so many opportunities available, it was indeed special. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, learning. Thanks a lot. And we, uh, we look forward to more association and collaboration in future with you. But not only on this, but maybe beyond you know, uh, other uh, areas of computing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your insightful points on Internet of Drone Things. May I now request Professor Dr. Kalpana Shavakana, General Chair, ICAP 2023, Associate Director, Research and Development, SMIT, Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, to offer token of acknowledgement and gratitude to Dr. Debasis Day. Organizing committee, I wish you good health and prosperity in life. Thank you once again, sir. I request the guests, signatories, participants, and staff to proceed for high tea in the adjacent room. Volunteers are requested to escort the guests. Next session, next session. Kindly be seated back by 11:45 a.m. for the next session by Dr. S. Choudhury. By 11:40, we are going to start. By 11:40. Please kindly be seated by 11.40 a.m. Thank you. 
Basic to never more so.
give this dais to him. Uh, we would like to welcome him formally. Uh, I would like to request uh, uh, HODCAC sir to kindly offer khada to Professor S. Chaudhary. This is a uh, this is a nice thing that you know. Uh, yes, uh, we have our uh, HOD here, and his teacher is also here and sharing the same tires. Thank you. Also, uh, okay. Also, uh, we are very happy to have uh, amongst us in this session uh, Dr. Pratibha Rai. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining. Uh, I would request again uh, Professor UK Chakravarti with the honors to welcome her. Uh, Professor Pratima Rai was with us, she was our colleague, but right now she is uh, in uh, other organization. But uh, thank you very much, madam, for being here. Uh, next, we have our industry partners. Uh, we have Mr. Dev Dipta, he is from Keysight. Uh, I would request. Uh, Professor Udi Chakravarti to offer khada. Thank you, sir, for traveling all the way from Calcutta for this uh, conference. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. And yes, another surprise for you people. Uh, we have another industry partner, uh, senior folk now with Keysight, Mr. Achut Sharma, and uh, he is and he is our own student and alumni, 2016. So today's session we have right now talk from Professor Chaudhary, then we will break and subsequently we will be having a session by our industry partner Keysight Technologies. So uh, let us make this day an interesting one. Thank you, sir. So over to you, sir. I request everyone to kindly avoid walking from the front passage. I repeat, once the session is in progress, I request everyone to kindly avoid walking from the front passage. A very good morning to everyone present here today. As we gather here today with the second talk of the day, I, Muskan Sarda, take the honor to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. S. Chaudhary. Professor Dr. S. Chaudhary. Dr. S. Chaudhary is currently associated with the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, National Institute of Technology, Durgapur, as a professor. Dr. Chaudhary is a renowned academic personality and researcher in the field of science and engineering. He holds UG and PhD degree from NIT Durgapur and PG from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. His research interest lies in the fields of network and distributed systems, stochastic modeling of complex systems, and computational social systems. So, without wasting any further time, I would like to welcome Professor, Professor Dr. Subrata Chaudhary to the stage. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think okay, I am audible. Uh, so, uh, it was an uh, excellent lecture, basically. The previous speaker uh, told about the, uh, the unfolding of drone technology and IoT integration combination. So, uh, my lecture is basically. Uh, it, it is introducing a new area where we uh, did less research. 
but which is very very important for the future. That is uh, what we mean by computational social science. Okay, so far uh, what we have seen, the progress of computing okay, has created a, a digital divide and that divide is gap is increasing. Computer and digital technology making lot of making lot of progress. When we want to show the light, but there is a pot of light. Below the light, there is some darkness. So our light we cannot really shine unless we become inclusive. Unless we grow with the pot of and talk together. Okay. So this is uh, this is what social scientists are trying to do for uh, time. Uh, it's lots of time, but uh, they are very difficult. The social system is a complex system. It's very very complex system. Now uh, approaching social system and giving it a scientific uh, direction like physics uh, that we have done. It, it, it becomes very difficult. What are the difficulties? What are the challenges? And what are the new opportunities are uh, uh, offered to us by computing system, uh, current computing technology uh, that will explore, that will see how the how, what are the possibilities and what we can do with this. Mainly, my focus will be on public policy design using the science of computation social. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, what I am going to say, a uh, few things, that is, what is computational social science here, uh, income, uh, just, uh, uh, it is some discipline concerned with computational approach to social science. Basically, social science didn't have much computational approach up here, no, we need to be. This means that computers are used to model, simulate and analyze social phenomena. Our fields include computational economics. It was in an old field going for a long time, almost 30 years computational economics was working. Computational sociology, comparatively new but few attempts were uh, made. Uh, the Plydeon, that is the Plydeon dynamics is a actually integration of uh, social science, the economic, sociology, culture, uh, and other society related issues. Okay, we, we bring together. And uh, culturomics is basically uh, cultural economics. We, we just look into that, these things are not very much different from each other. Okay. And, uh, the automated analysis of content in social and traditional media, etc. This is also included here, but uh, they are part of computing science, okay, uh, and they are applied efficiently in case of computer science. Uh, it, it focuses investigating social behavior, relationship, interactions, and all such things, uh, and uh, we develop uh, social simulations, simulated societies where we can perform experiment before designing the policy. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, actually, uh, this, this definition was put forward by uh, American uh, Computational Social Science Society of America. Okay. So, uh, they were one of the leading uh, people those who were there. Now, it is where that the problem is relevant, it is important, that is, uh, it is it's it's very relevant. Why it is so much necessary today to approach such social science and apply computational methodology there? It is that is unprecedented inequality. Why it is unprecedented? I will show later. Okay, the environmental crisis. Uh, basically, uh, basic thing that will come to environmental crisis is carbon footprint. Okay. Now. Uh, this carbon footprint, uh, as we have seen, computational technology, okay, uh, with some social ethics, if we can apply uh, computational technology, actually, previous speaker was pointing out some few points there. 
okay, how you can scale the energy, etc. Uh, so we can reduce footprint computer can uh, help in some way or other. And uh, that is another another problem we are facing that uh, some kind of job grants we are facing. Okay. Now uh, because of uh, uh, upcoming of this uh, AI ML technology together, uh, that again previous speakers from you have seen that a lot of things can be uh, can go to machines. Okay. Now, uh, poss but possibly there exists humanity, okay, which is uh, pretty much different from machine. Uh, personally, if someone asks me what is intelligence, I can't say. I don't know what is intelligence. Because to me, uh, creativity is the, uh, that is expression of intelligence. And what is creativity? How computer can create? That is. I, I don't know whether it matches with our emotional aspects, <coughs> our feeling. These are difficult questions where we have to, if you say machine learning, intelligence, we are using those words uh, possibly in, in diluted fashion. Uh, we, are, we are making them fashionable, but going to the uh, depth of these words are very important. Okay, we should understand the meaning. And possibly for human, what I can understand, that is care and empathy. I can understand that is fundamental to human. And uh, possibly human will do for what human exists. That is care, empathy, understanding others, feeling for others, and others. Okay. So that is, uh, now this is the uh, relevance and under this this, this is what it should have been, but if we look into reality, some look into reality if we find why well, the problem is, this is uh, uh, taken from uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, that Capital in 21st Century book. Now here, if you see, look into it, it starts from 1870 and goes to up to 2010 and still the trend is there. It is, it shows that after <coughs> Top one percent of people uh, will that was generated to top one percent of people of US. It follows that path. Okay, uh, it came down. Then again, it has a uh, rise, and it, it now it is going to this position. Means where the top one percent is this much. Okay, uh, you can understand. Uh, so uh, this. That, that was the increase, okay. And if we come to next nine percent, it's this month. It is also increasing. Uh, but uh, this is actually where concentration. What we are saying now, if you look into the scar from 1870 to coming to a point, if we come to this point, this point, just look into this. This is the time of World War One. Okay, and uh, after World War One, that it has come down. Well, concentration of, of top uh, of, of one percent that, that has come down because very high that it came down, and uh, it again came down nearly 1950. Actually, this part it was coming down, down from that is World War Two, and. Then progressively, if you look into this, uh, uh, from this graph, you can see that from this point uh, <coughs> up to this, there was moderate increase, but increase for others were also there. Okay. Coming to this point, where of this top is increasing at very high rate. Okay. It is like that. If you come to 21, it is almost like this. <coughs> this will be also a little bit like this and, and this is possibly the meaning same. So uh, this is the position what, what we find that uh, for a developed society, I have taken uh, US as an example here. Now uh, it is, uh, will be, uh, that is US mode, that is uh, whatever I said previously, actually it is another diagram, it shows up to 2016, uh, UNDP, uh, I am taking. Uh, this is, uh, 
Germany and UK I have shown in two separate uh, images. So uh, it is this is in Germany, this is in UK. And uh, the trend in UK is again just like US. Okay, where concentration to fewer head is growing. And uh, coming to Germany, it is much more modest. It's not that, uh, but still there is a trend of more concentration towards fewer rich people. That is there. Uh, but it's modest in case of Germany. It's high in UK. Uh, if you come to India, that is uh, very, very, uh, I find that uh, this thing we can see here, uh, uh, we should be very uh, careful. That is, if you look into, it is uh, top 10 percent, uh, that is green is top 1 percent, and it is bottom 50 percent. You can see clearly that bottom 50 percent, how it is showing from uh, 1961 and Coming from this point, if you look, okay, uh, that is, we, we call it that neoliberal economy, where it is coming, then this bottom 50 percent is reducing, and red is uh, there, and green is. You can understand what the uh, inequality where we are reaching. Now, uh, this is actually, we had, sometimes we thought that things will be excellent. Excellent means when it was that, uh, idea is that when uh, wealth is generated, it will triple down to the bottom. That was the understanding. And it was, it has got very strong social theories. Uh, like, I, yes? Sir, question here. Yeah. I understand this graph. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, does it take into account the yeah. increase in per capita income? No, it is not taking uh, per capita income. Okay. Uh, because it is showing whatever, it is not absolute, value. it is a relative value. So that's what I am trying to understand. Yeah. How has it in per capita income, uh, starting from this point to today's point, it is six times in India. If you go to total GDP, okay, and then if we divide it by population, uh, at present we are at one forty-four position, and if we adjust, there is something we call that is uh, inequality adjusted PPP per capita income, purchasing power parity. There our rank of one twenty-eight. Okay, uh, I am not going to the details of all those things, but I was just wondering how this. <coughs> That's right. ah, so uh, you can understand that is I am showing the uh, this is this is uh, not inclusive growth. That is what my point is. Okay. So uh, uh, we are coming to that. Okay. In, while I am saying as it is social issues, there will be uh, some what can I say? Uh, unforeseen. Uh, Possibly there will be some doubts and difficulties, and like whatever he said, that uh, it should be clarified. Okay. So, uh, if we come to the economic history, okay, economic history, this is we, we get that first generation free market economy, that is Adam Smith's classical uh, economy, the kind of uh, invisible hand, okay, free market. Then it comes. Complete social ownership, Karl Marx theories. Then we come to tension and balance between these two. Okay, where there was fall of free market economy. If we go to again US graph or other countries graph, we will come that in 1930 there was great depression and there was no way out from that. Okay, similarly we find in 2008. Okay, uh, but in less magnitude. So, uh, now, uh, their Keynesian theory uh, came up, that is, there was a, a, a control, control of the nation, national things like uh, centralized bank and other things. Okay. Uh, then, uh, then there was neoclassical, that is mathematical classical economics, and 
then neoliberal free market globalization hello we get that is sub 1990 or what i could say and uh, this is this is what but a uh, outcome of all those things already possible we have seen what was the outcome in the previous graphs okay that's what uh, we will see and now uh, okay and uh, i think some problems i have not mentioned here uh, what we need okay uh, i'm coming to uh, this was one of the problem economic inequality say and two more problem that we had that is second one is climate and third one is job threat because of ai ever now uh, coming to that carbon emission possibly actually we have difficulties in geopolitics okay whenever we find difficult is conflicts like geopolitics conflicts then actually answer of conflict is cooperation conflict and cooperation scenario how we find that that is global level without global level cooperation we can solve the problem conflict okay we can't reduce it water resource uh, again uh, it can be somewhat reduced by using recycling technologies and other things that computer oh uh, give some relief to that but it's a severe issue and we should search for alternative ozone uh, similarly uh, let ozone layer depletion uh, uh, basically we have to uh, be it is a ethical issue okay means uh, ethical what i was saying that will come to this thing later okay and uh, job threats ai level as i told earlier that in job press our experience was that when there was job threats at different times that we found some alternative job opportunities were created okay so here uh, i am hopeful hopeful that uh, what we said human centric job human centric and already we told that care Okay, empathy uh, and creativity, which machines are not <coughs> capable of doing. So, every man actually we have got creative part inside all of us. You know, we have got creative, which we keep unused. But human is creative. Only routine job does not make us. but machine are, are, are doing our routine jobs are reducing or making us stronger that we can save time from routine job and put our more time on creating and possibly uh, it is not a problem uh, after the initial stage it will it will become <coughs> creative for us now uh, can we make it better that Uh, that is united nation development program program and sustainable development goal to go that is uh, that is sustainable development goal goal sdg paper if you read that is just united nations the good find that yeah we can make it better by making it better actually how we can make it better that I, i am just showing how we can uh, that is our focus should be on human development okay now uh, that is cool. one thing is that at some point of time there were utilitarian theory or we were saying that welfare economics welfare theory where uh, possibly you were aware that ubi your universal basic income this kind of thoughts are coming to people that by a uh, becoming a member of the society a basic income will be ensured for you okay that is in developed countries and others you will find that ubi is a uh, trying to people are coming to uh, decide on a ubi what should be the value now 
Uh, immobiliary is a basically welfare scheme. And uh, this possibly uh, uh, Professor Shen, he was the first person to talk against UBI. Okay. Uh, UBI does not take care of what aspect, what we call that capability. If I give you an income, okay, I give some money, and if you are not capable of using it, say gifting a bicycle to someone who can't ride the bicycle, then our purpose is not solved. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, uh, now this he he emphasized the individual capabilities. Okay, uh, considering true human development, and when we come to true human development, then things like life expectancy uh, and education, these two things come. Now, only GDP per capita does not mean anything. Okay. What means is along with GDP per capita that if we can combine that education, span of education and life expectancy. Okay. If he has got money and he is not well to use that money, it does not mean anything. An uneducated person does not know how to use the money. They keep their money inside their... Uh, okay. Uh, so, there are a lot of, I am not coming to the details of this, we can understand what it means. Now, uh, now, these three things, actually, if my GDP per capita say is G and my uh, education is E and life expectancy is uh, say L, if these are the average values, Okay, if I, if I take there the average means uh, per capita, per capita, then if I take that uh, cube root of this G E L, then it gives me HDL, human development index. Okay, so this human development index actually this is geometric mean we are taking. Geometric mean actually one value will not change the mean value a lot, which is the problem with arithmetic average. Okay, if one very high value rest at zero, then it gives you a good average. But situation is not a very good thing. So, uh, now these three things are together, uh, we came to human development index. And uh, now, uh, that is, that has been Along with there exists some inequality measurement because Gini factor. Now Gini factor along with HDI, if we normalize HDI with Gini factor, then what we get is inequality adjusted human development index. So state of the state of the society at a particular point of time is measured with this value. Okay. Now uh, and there is no uh, end to it. This is actually what I am trying to say. What should have been? What it should have been? And where we are? And where we are and from? Now I am talking about what it should have been. And that will show how computing can help us to take to where what it should have been and what are the research opportunities in this direction. Now, if we come to this, this is a very, very important slide. I will say that uh, we can put a little bit attention on uh, every whatever is it. Martha Nussbaum, one of the, uh, what can I say, most respected, reputed thinker of this generation. Not this generation, she is. Uh, 80s of the Octogenian. Now, Martha Nussbaum developed a very comprehensive, systematic and influential capability theory that goes beyond what Sam and others uh, said earlier, capability theory of justice, that is the theory of justice. She aims to provide a partial theory. Actually, justice can always be partial. When society grows, concept of justice also becomes finite. Okay. Uh, 
and one that does not exist. Okay, I told. Based on dignity, a list of fundamental capabilities. Actually, ten capabilities she mentioned. Mention. Okay, ten capabilities. We can go to uh, justice theory of Bart uh, Hanuska uh, to see the details there. Okay, now what we have told about IHDI. Now, other than just individual where we have taken physical capability, life expectancy, health, she even takes into account rights for protection of an individual self-respect. It is very much in, uh, important uh, when psychologically that a person living without self-respect. Okay, UBI will not give you self-respect. Okay. These are very consistent social theories. Okay. Self-respect uh, to participate in uh, societal process. Okay. And to think, feel freely, think and feel freely is fundamental to human. Okay. And in her capability theory, she also considers right to express emotions freely. Right to express emotion, not only words, express emotions freely. Okay. To be attached to each other individuals, we should make friends. To be able to play, have fun, even to be able and sensible to uh, live with concern for or relation to animals, plants, and the world of nature. What we find that. Exactly, that is our uh, human development. If we put it in the right platform, then basically it tells us to be a really a, a, a real human being that can enjoy every every what can I say uh, thing that is offered to us by nature and other fellow human beings or animals or. What? That's one, one thing I will mention here that uh, if we know that uh, famous Bengali tables, some Jagote Ananda Jogdiya Manu Mantra. So, this is uh, what Martha Nusra, we have to uh, enjoy. And, and enjoy where we are born. We should enjoy our life to the fullest extent. That's what it should be. And that's what we could do. What's the situation I discussed in previous slides where uh, we kept most of us deprived from those qualities. Now, now it is said that uh, very interesting things will come after that. Darwinian uh, and others are uh, coming. Now, now, background of CSS, if I look into, okay, it did come with that composition of social sense, it did come with this when social sense tried to solve their problem, they tried to, they found that success of physics was enormous. So, you <coughs> can represent things with uh, equations, okay, and get a mathematical solution to the social problem, then it will be more systematic, more scientific. And it was, uh, uh, they tried with uh, differential equations, they identified variable uh, determined relationship that uh, deductive logic, inductive logic, all kinds of logics were used and uh, currently uh, we, we've got statistical correlation in regression, even data analytics tools that we are having, uh, we are applying everything. But we can't solve the problem. Why we can't solve the problem? We are coming to that moment. Dynamics of relationship can also be modeled by differential equation and applied in physical sciences and technologies. However, the system becomes too complex when applied to social science because of the non-linearity that micro level uncertainties, every individual is free to do. It's not like a uh, pass of uh, pass M1. A thing of past M1, where M1 is said for uh, all such things. Oh, and, and, and micro 
to macro and reverse mechanism. Actually, our microactivity, our individual activities, <coughs> give rise to a average activity of, of the social activity. But it, it is a difficult situation because it is not the arithmetic sum. It is emergence phenomenon we call. Okay. Uh, now, uh, then again, that macro result. Also, when we look into the macro result, we change our micro behavior. So, this is a wide relationship, something like possibly we have turned to the network, we have come to this. So, uh, now, and with that, that, that there was an ambitious, ambitious person, means just I am showing here, uh, what, what it says is that. Uh, this is the economic state of a society. Okay, why is the variable? So, uh, mathematically they try D or D with time how economic system will change. Then this says that it will change with uh, economic system how much we have achieved so far. What is remaining? Okay, if I have made some achievement, then my rate of uh, change will be lower. You can understand that uh, the GDP of the developed countries, you see, Europe say, it is always less than 2%. For US, it is always less than 3%. You will find. Okay. So, more and more we achieve economically, possibly our growth prospect will be less. But what we are getting, that is, our growth not only depends on what our economic state is. It is also dependent on D. D is the democratic environment. It is uh, economics and uh, sociology, that's democratic environment. Uh, it is a factor of both. Okay. Uh, without democracy, economic growth does not mean anything. Okay. Examples I am not citing, but you can find them. Okay. So, uh, now, from there, actually there exists uh, rational secular behavior, RS we are telling that. RS is basically also dependent on our economic condition and current value of RS. Okay. Actually from democratic uh, development, in sense of democracy development us, then from there rational secular thinking comes. Now, Rational secular thinking give up, that is self esteem or, or self expression, what we call. That is autonomy, the autonomous devices we are thinking, but human autonomy is very important. Okay. So, that is, uh, uh, now this, uh, this value, that is self expression, also improves with, it is basically economic development, democratic sense. Then rational secular thinking from there we got self expression. Okay. And this self expression again makes our democracy better, which again brings to an economic change. Okay. In economic important. If democracy increases, then my economy will be better. And this follows this circle. That was uh, that is a uh, theory that is established by a uh, number of scientists to several years research and uh, come now this thing we cannot uh, we cannot get better data we, we didn't have uh, data analytic tools we didn't have a uh, way of simulating or, or running this model all these are non-linear equations which are related to uh, every other things now this human development dynamic theory showed us a way and it was basically, uh, uh, basically it says that things will grow. Okay. Things will always grow and it says again that freedom, okay, some got free market economy and uh, it will be a perennial growth, will give us perennial growth. But when we look into the results, statistical results, then we find that things have not gone like that. Okay. So, 
somewhere we are missing something. We are missing that this is a simplistic assumption. Actually, social systems are more complex, and we have to approach social systems in completely different way. Completely different way will be that uh, I am not coming to this. Uh, we use that. Uh, I, I told uh, problem is that for more complex system, uh, we get bigger set of differential equations and more complex embedded influence networks. Actually, what we are, we are thinking that everyone is taking decision independently, but actually decisions are influenced by each other in a society. And we have to identify those influence networks. So that was not taken into consideration uh, in, in social scientist per view. And uh, that uh, part of decision process we can apply, but we have to take this thing into account. Again, time series analysis was used, but time series analysis we can use for prediction. Okay. Explanation is more important. Unless we can explain why such value came, we cannot design a useful policy. That is important. And so on, this was there. Now, and uh, I discussed almost problem with the uh, system. Only one point I have not discussed, that is cooperation and conflict scenario. Okay, uh, if we go by total Darwinian uh, theories, the evolution, and what we say that uh, survive, uh, those who fit us will survive, but natural selection. Okay. So, natural selection says it is very true. According to natural selection, the world is very cruel. Cruel means if you, if you can understand the competition, you are eliminated. Okay. Uh, only those who are uh, selected fittest, they will survive. And, they will not, and it does not have any conflict with that uh, uh, the free market uh, economy <coughs> and something. And there was a belief, okay, neo, neoliberal thinkers, 1990 years. So, Almost there was consensus that that is the way. Okay, you are not so. Uh, we said that you are not good at studies, will perish. You are good and you will be. So, uh, if if someone is suffering, marginalized, it is because of you. Okay, you did, could not survive this Darwinian world. But uh, if you go to Noel Harari, are you, are you, are you aware of? Just I'm saying that uh, one, one thing, a uh, little bit time possibly it, it, it may say. But the thing is that if you look into difference between uh, other species as human, other species as human, if I try, try to find out the difference, then we can, the focus chimpanzee in, uh, in, in, a, in a, uh, Ireland, one chimpanzee and me, I go there. So, uh, who will survive? Possibly Shippanji will survive. Okay, I can't reply to you and get food and something. Now, if 10 Shippanji is a 10 human being, the 10 Shippanji will survive. But if you put uh, 1,000 Shippanji and 1,000 human being, then you will find they will survive. Because they can, actually, we can cooperate. Human, uh, in that Darwin's theory, it was fine, but later uh, there were some modifications by other scientists, like uh, talking was the last uh, contributor. Now, uh, there, there was cooperation, <coughs> not only survival of the fittest. Those who could cooperate, they survived. And human can cooperate. Simpanji can also power it, but 10 simpanjis, a family of simpanjis can, uh, can sustain, they can say that, okay, that is a uh, right banana, banana bunch is there, but there is a tiger here, don't go. One can show other that the tiger is there, so they will not go to get the banana out. Okay. Uh, this is their power it, those five Simpanjis are co cooperating among themselves, first of all. But they are cooperating based on 
a real object. But if we are human, human is different from others, but human can operate on abstract concept. Okay, so this abstract concept can be different forms. In folklore, they pain, pain as, uh, uh, what can I say, uh, local gods. In uh, organized religions, they claim as uh, God. Okay, it's something like that. Oh, don't do this, God will punish you. Do good, help people. Don't harm anyone, otherwise you will be punished. So, this is what an abstract. <coughs> There was no real object but to show people. But based on those concepts, we will cooperate with each other. Okay. So this cooperation, uh, this human cooperation that, that happened, man is di different, or some species, any species will be different, where it can uh, cooperate based on something abstract. Human rights, democracy, constitution, okay, human dignity, United Nations, they are abstract concept. They are office exist physically, but concept is abstract, set of rules and regulations. Now, this based on those abstract concepts we are cooperating. Possibly for climate we need the abstraction of the concept, for saving ourselves and uh, when problem becomes bigger, say COVID, then our scale of cooperation should be high. Abstraction should be much higher. Where uh, individuals, family, uh, region, uh, states, nation, okay, everything we have to come out of and think as individual human beings. So they are current, in current scenario, Every kind of division, even in the name of nation, will not help us to achieve that human goal. Okay, nationalism, uh, uh, Tego wrote, say, uh, 100 years back on nationalism. Please read the book. Okay, it, it, it's always not something to celebrate. Okay, somewhere we have to come out and become global person. So, uh, uh, and now coming to conflict and scenario, we we'll find the game theory. Now I am going a little bit to uh, the technological aspect, but very much of time I, I have used up, I think, a lot of time. Is it? Okay, uh, I will have 20 minutes more. Is it? Organizers? Okay, okay. So, now this is normal prisoner's dilemma game. Prisoner's dilemma game means most of us will say that uh, two persons, uh, two persons, they, they were involved in a crime. So they have stolen something. And they are taken into different rooms. Okay, they are being investigated. Now, they are given the deal that if you are involved, okay, and if you have uh, not, if you are really involved, if you confess, then you will not be punished. Okay. And the same thing was told to both. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise, if, if you find that, uh, you say that you were not, you, if you deny, and you did this thing, then your punishment will be five years. You see that here, uh, uh, this person, if he lies, then we get five years of imprisonment. Okay. Otherwise, zero. If you confess, okay. uh, if you confess, uh, now, if he confess, and that person also confess, okay. then. Both of them three years of in, 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 in imprisonment. If he lies and other person confess, then he gets five years and that person gets zero year. So same is true for blue person also. 
both the both the tips red and blue. Now, uh, now you can understand that if if they have got uh, they don't have full trust on each other. Okay, then to minimize their risk, they will confess. And if both of them confess, he confess, you confess, both of them get three years of prison. Okay, but if they could have uh, trust each other very strongly, and both deny that we have not done it, then. Both of them to the work one year of design. Now, this is also a stable state. No one can unilaterally, unilaterally move from this position, from this strategy of conference. Okay. Uh, no one can improve his position unilaterally. If, say, a red person move from this to that, he is not gaining anything. He's and if he moves there, then he gains. But at that time, the blue person will move there. Okay. So uh, you you can find that uh, this is a stable position. This is also a stable position. Now this mutually stable position from where you will let up a movement. Do not give any benefit to any of the player. Those positions will call their dash equilibrium of the game. Okay. Now, if we come to the dash uh, equilibrium, uh, if both A and B say, if both A and B wants to minimize this, then they, uh, they will CC will be the equilibrium, that is, uh, they will uh, confess will be the equilibrium. And, and note that the reward, actually punishment, actually reward will be uh, minus 3, minus 3, or 3, 3. And if they have trust on each other, they will get minus 1, minus 1. Okay, that is a uh, punishment. So, this is better solution. Okay, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, okay. Where I was? But I am not getting that uh, slide. Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, what, what you find that these two equilibrium there? So, actually. In a game, there will be many Nash equilibria, where they will, uh, in society, society basically all of us are playing multiple games. All of us want to maximize our utility, individual's utility, and uh, we give our good in every aspect, it, it, economics, purchasing something from market, seller and buyer, multiple seller, multiple buyer, all of that. Basically, we are giving some books and we have got a set of strategy. From those strategies, we choose one strategy which is which maximizes my income. Okay. So, the social phenomena you can model with game. Okay. Now, when, and in a game, there will be equilibrium, Nash equilibrium, and there can be multiple Nash equilibrium in a game. Okay. Now, we have to choose the best Nash equilibrium. This is what uh, is required for us. Okay. Now, a game can have multiple Nash equilibrium, Nash equilibrium of pure strategies. I am not discussing what is pure strategies. Okay. Now, any game that can be expressed, this is for information to all, that every game or all social cooperation conflict scenario, whatever we have, any game that can be expressed in strategic form, okay, at least has one Nash equilibrium of mixed strategies. When mixed strategies mean that always I will be say he, he confess or 
confession line to two strategy I, I have to choose from. Okay. Now I cannot choose uh, always I will choose confess. That may not be true. I can sometimes can choose confess, sometimes <coughs> why. So it depends upon uh, that there is a probability of choosing. Now in general there are many strategies available to a player and out of that I can choose the strategy according to a probability distribution. Okay. And I can learn that probability distribution from analyzing the data and coming to that. Now, here, uh, but we understand that there exists a mesh with your mixed strategies. Mixed strategies means I get a probability profile which leads us to a particular solution. Now, in general, they will have multiple mesh equilibrium of pure and mixed strategy that we have to choose the uh, right strategy. Just for example, okay, if I maximize the sum total of utilities, so many players are playing, and sum total of utility, I want to maximize. That, that may be the goal of the game. Every individual wants to utilize, yeah, maximize its utility. So, if choose their strategy according to that, then uh, there can be that uh, we will think that it is a, it is the best solution, it will maximize our utility. But this may not happen. Okay. It does not happen. Even maximum, total utility maximization may lead to the in inequality situation. If someone gains a lot okay, and others lose that gain of one person may show you a very good gene. Okay, if it may take the average. Uh, but actually it is a uh, it, it is asymmetric growth. Okay. Uh, so this may not be our objective. Okay. Rather there can be different objective. Uh, uh, optimal desirable solution with Okay, and probably this is not a very uh, desired thing. Maximum utility for target group, but no loss for others. So gain is justified in distribution. Okay, games are often not likely to attain an optimal mesh equilibrium of pure strategies, mixed strategies. We need to regulate incentive. Uh, the art of this kind of incentive design we call mechanism. So here one important story is by mechanism design what we say we can design policy so that when players are playing game, okay, when players are playing game, they follow the strategy's probability distribution. What satisfy our goal? These are basically regulations. Regulation can be in, uh, in the form of law or regulation can be in the form of incentive or regulation can be in the form of uh, not only incentive that it can be in the form of nudge, nudge that is talents, even economics novel plus we expect. Okay. That was not, that is default income tax in this budget default is uh, what is new one. It is a match. If you uh, read the budget document. Nudge means uh, if you don't give option that you will put there. Okay. So it is somehow pushing without having okay. or saying you really give. Now uh, this becomes actually mechanism design. So I can design mechanism that the rules of a game can be decided so that our desired goal is achieved. That is what policy formulation is. Okay. Now, uh, this thing we can take, uh, now I, I am not possibly, basically game theory is a toolbox for social sciences. Okay. And, uh, uh, okay, all this, what is important here, I am coming to this one. 
all the above things are regarding the theory little bit I wanted to discuss the time is less. Okay. Now what we, we can do that uh, here as we were saying that how cooperation exists. If we look into the profile of the species now existing, okay, the cruel survival of the fittest and natural selection would have not put all the varieties of species together. Okay. Their interdependence is maintained in the, in the current state. Okay. Evolution is, is a wonderful thing. And this evolution is something. Now I say game. If game is played, played repeatedly, then what happens? By changing strategies. We have different at different, I had many times to play the game. In history, you went with what? Many times to play the games. Okay. Every person in individual life, we get many times. Once we play one thing, we don't know what is good or what is bad. But we sense it, we prove it. Once we play one strategy, next we play another strategy, next we play possibly again that strategy, then again another person. Said that is confess and lie, confess and lie. We keep on performing experiment. And we find that, okay, lie gives me this person is trustable. And repeated, if I say, then play the game, that is important. That the play the game repeated. They may gradually adjust their behavior over time until there is no further room for improvement. At that stage, they have achieved. So, that's why cooperation exists. Okay, in cruel Darwinian worlds, that's why uh, they are this hope that we can make a Muslim society, Muslim society. So, uh, then, how we do it? Okay, this is what I told earlier. Evolutionary game theory is well, okay, it leads to stable, to the closer to stable solution. And uh, some aspects, those who are interested, slides will be available with the organizer. Okay, uh, I have said that this had been, I, mean, I should say that that is the evolution of cooperation. And uh, actually, complexity of cooperation, complexity of cooperation. These two books by Excel Rod, okay. these are new books by Excel Rod, uh, we should read them. Okay. Along with that novel Harari, I, I told that, novel Harari story, Actually, the chimpanzee human being story was telling that is novel series. Uh, if you were that is sapient, a, a brief history of mankind, if you read and then history of future, yes, but three books, is a history. Okay. So, uh, it shows that my hand is not working. I'm sure it is possible. Is there anyone having dry hand? <laughs> Okay. okay. Now, uh, as I told that game in society, we can make multiple types of player of varying population. I'm just, I, I'm just showing that in a society, we can identify the player of different games. Okay. Uh, and we can create uh, players, that many number of players, proportional number of players for the, that strategy. Different types of people will play the game. Okay. And, uh, and each player makes autonomous decision. Okay. If this is the requirement for making a uh, society simplistic view, uh, I, I am not discussing this, can we succeed? Means, this goal, achieving this goal, can we succeed? If we say. Then we say that. Technology is showing us the way how to succeed there. 
One technology is agent technology. Okay. Agent is simple program. It is it can make autonomous decision. That previous speaker was speaking. Autonomous decision. It can sense. Okay. It can decide. And it can act. These three things an agent can do. Okay. And this decision is, is autonomous. Means any device in IoT kind of scenario also, it is true for human. Human can sense, read things. Okay. But agent here we are talking of a software entity which can read some environment area. Means it can sense. Okay. Then it can decide. Decide means it can make a decision and it can act to do something. And we can develop a we can Agent is a software and I can make a small program which, which can read, which can sense, decide and act. Act means it may be sending some communication software. So these agents, if I create multiple agents and run in my computer, then in my computer I can create a game Okay. Different agents will take autonomous decisions. They will run in individual separate threads. Okay. And they will read other agents' behavior as much as they can. They will make the decision and then they will decide what strategy to play. Okay. In this way, the whole society I can simulate within a computer. Okay. So this is this allows us to make artificial society. Okay, we can make an artificial society. Uh, so, uh, artificial society we can create. This is uh, how to create the artificial society. And uh, I have discussed. Which artificial society we does not mean that whole society. We, we, we mean that for a particular context. And if we make artificial society of multiple contexts, then we can different layers, we can merge them together to create a bigger artificial society. Okay. So, uh, in making artificial, now, now let the game start, we can play that. We have simulated the society, we can, all the threads are running and they are uh, reading things, they are deciding, thinking, they are making decisions, all the threads are doing and they are creating macro average results. Uh, they are also reading the macro results and from there again they are learning. All agents are learning and they are playing the game and they are going to what is best for them. Okay. Finding out cooperation solution which works better. And we need somewhat. This is something I am not discussing much. That is, it is seen in many of the cities throughout the world. Okay. Uh, it is say population we are telling the two races, say black and white. Okay. So black and white population here we are showing them as green and blue. Here yeah, green and red. Okay. Two races and then. Ideally there should be random distribution like this. But we will find that in most of the cases they are distributed like this. Okay. You will find population of white in particular area, population of black in black and this uh, black places are basically black places where people are not living. But here you can find that population is segregated. Same kind of people living here. Okay. Uh, you will find minority colonies, majority colonies, ghetto formation. Okay. Black and white everywhere in the world. Now, Ah, this work we have simulated and here that some work we are doing that how to actually if distribution is like this that it is good for society people need to move less for earning their bread okay particularly lower strata of the society those who are lower strata but if the residential settlement look like this okay here black people are there, there are white people are there, 
and deep industries there, and black people has to make a loss of a lot of money they have to spend on their community. Okay. Now, how to design policy so that people of different races or faith, or religion, or color, or race, they can uh, live together. Okay. This is this is a thing we can very easily, actually, there exist Sakota and Shelling's residential segregation models. Okay. We can work, we, we, we are working on that and we are finding solution. Possibly, this solution we will find, it completely agrees with sustainable development goal, <coughs> a de-urbanization, which leads to de-urbanization, goal of humanity. Okay. So it is problem, local problem should be solved for global understanding. Even our simulation results are showing this. Another problem. Ha, five minutes. Okay. Only five minutes. Five problem. Okay. This is another problem we are trying to solve. That is uh, in education system. I am uh, not going into details, but Ah, we are trying to find out, we are trying to find out embedded network in the society. Okay, embedded influence network in the society from data, historical data. And uh, based on that we are designing the policy. So, coming out of this and uh, example one to where we are going. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, this, they are some of our observations. So, uh, they are some characteristics we found out. Uh, so, uh, what here we need to add? Uh, we need to actually, we have simulated the society. Okay, we have simulated, but it may not mimic the reality. Now, if it is not mimicking the reality, okay, then what do we have to do? We have got historical data. We have got a lot of data available regarding uh, a particular discourse. Okay. Now, at every turn and the previous turn, previous turn, current turn, then previous turn, then current, the input output relation we know. So it is like adjusting a neural network okay, uh, uh, to learn the situation, real situation. And we can correct this real situation through this training process. Okay. The databases are available in this uh, website. You will find the computation and software sets. And you can use software through any logic. Or you can use network. Or you can use Python software tool for uh, actually social system simulation. Uh, even you can use your, you can use your uh, property proper there. And coming to this, uh, as I told that with policy we can make realistic society. Uh, one thing is important here if we uh, if we go through possibly you know that uh Obijit Banerjee, Obijit Banerjee, they carried out past time experimental economy. Okay. That is economics they applied to uh, uh, society and different projects. Now experimental economics takes five, six, seven hours time to understand what policy is doing. Okay. That our city, we can randomize control traffic, it takes time. Okay. Now uh, this randomized control trial can be uh, implemented within a computer and we can get Within a few days, we can get the result that is uh, that was the book. And uh, there are some interesting facts that uh, network graph are not coming. We can learn. Say, if you get some thing is if you get some tickets, okay, lot of air ticket, then you can make the airlines network. Learning graph from data. That learning graph from data actually help us 
in understanding the embedded network in the society from social data. And uh, we are uh, working on that as well. Why? And is okay. And integrating everything and uh, is there anyone? Okay, these references I will put with uh, those people and the committee. Okay. And uh, we are sorry that I have spoken too much. Is there, uh, but there should be some questions. Uh, there should be questions I expect from all of you. Yes. Okay, one more thing. These results are collaborative. You should collaborate with social scientists. Okay. Uh, uh, that is, uh, otherwise it is very difficult to get particular domains. Yes. Uh, so I am Nachal from Kisai. Uh, I have two queries. Basically, the first query is like, how do we avoid biasness uh, when we are designing such models? Because there may be like, we might be thinking in one particular way, but we avoid the other section of the society, right? If we are thinking like, in GDP term, we might be live, uh, missing out on the happiness index, right? How would that have their own happiness index? So how do we try to avoid biasness in this approach? Actually, happiness index, if you say, then it is uh, actually Nusman, whatever I discussed, that gave rise to happiness index. That was the fundamental paper. So, uh, as it is uh, same as that, but biasness is a big question. And uh, that's why ethical biasness is not only here. In AI, it is too much. Okay. So, ethical aspect of computer science. As I was saying that we should be more dedicated. Okay. Now, our dedication to truth, particularly computer scientist society, those who are going, working in AI and do Say chat GPT is available to you. You can write comments, your, your correction on chat GPT. It will get data from you. Now, if you, if you want, if you have bought a big trial brigade and put wrong information, biased information in chat GPT, it, it may do wrong it next time. So, it is our, that uh, the computer science society, it is actually this reflects state of our society. If we are truthful, unless we are truthful, we cannot attain what we want. Okay. So, this ethical issue means being great, okay, it is okay, but more important is important is being good. So, this is, this is what I Thank you so much. Sir, another query that yeah. I have is if we reduce the uh, gap between what is reality and what is simulation, then what is your thought on like whether we are the popular simulated world, right? Maybe. Uh, if we are reducing the gap between what is simulated and what is reality, uh, then. Uh, what? No, actually, <laughs> that, is a, uh, that is a question of different dimension. I am not coming here. You are saying that by we are a simulated society. Okay. There is no reason to think this so far. Because our knowledge uh, so far we learn uh, up to big bang. From there we could explain things. So this question is not coming now. We don't know. Means Simple question is that before Big Bang, intelligence developed from matter. Our brain, if you take, it is intelligent, but it is a special form of matter. Intelligence has given rise to matter. That is wrong. Because intelligence itself is matter. So, matter to mind, it is not mind to matter. Okay. So, definitely, this is. That's why I said that God is an abstract concept. But it did good to people. It did this over. I am not against religion, but uh, thinking something which is 
brought to Rome, not to this fakeness uh, we should avoid by dissembling. Your question, but question. Okay. Uh, any other question? Actually, some more debatable issues uh, I raise, but we cannot uh, keep mum regarding those things because uh, these are the reality and we have to meet the challenge because people are crying. We are under threat. We may destroy ourselves. Our next to next generation may be big problems. So we cannot. Your next generation. So we can't avoid those things uh, for avoiding debates. Okay, let all academic institutes and such platform be an excellent forum for debate and free expression of thoughts. Any any more questions? A place where everyone is hungry. Yes, sir. Always my class or not, lecture comes just before the lunch. And, <laughs> and I think uh, strategically people do it. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Now what what uh, okay uh, okay so Listen to the song John Lennon's Imagine. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for Thank you. Sir. Thank you.
Uh, kindly put your uh, phones on silent mode, please. And please maintain silence. So this particular event will is being live streamed. So therefore, you know, please maintain uh, the silence. I again request the gathering to be seated. Once the session is on progress, I request everyone to please avoid walking from the front passage. As we gather here this afternoon for the invited industry talk by Keysight Technologies, I, Ria Kim, take the honor of introducing our guest speakers, Mr. Dev Dilta Kumar and Mr. Ajut Sharma from Keysight Technologies. individuals are gifted with wide knowledge and smooth skills on their respective fields. Mr. Dev Dutta Kumar is a senior manager, software development, and Mr. Akshur Sharma is a technical lead, application and threat intelligence at Keysight Technology. It is our pleasure to host you both in this fourth edition of ICAP 2023. Without any further delay, may I now request our industry partner representative from Keysight to please come up to the stage. So that we as students or maybe as researchers can correlate and then you know 
maybe work in that dimension or you know, think uh, from a, I would like to present some industry viewpoints, right? So that you can correlate that may, that may help you with your day-to-day -day activities. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, what is cybersecurity? I think everyone knows, but I just want to you know, create the context of what cybersecurity actually means, right? So cybersecurity is the act of managing or securing our devices. It can be anything, right? Your mobile phone, your, uh, let's say, drones, your uh, IoT home uh, cameras, it can be anything. So the act of securing those devices or your, even your personal data, right? So that, uh, you know, there is no misuse of information, there is no misuse uh, in, those, in, the, in today's world where everything is interconnected, right? There is high likelihood chances that, you know, the information leakage may happen or some threats might attack you, right? So the cyber security as a whole is, you know, its goal is to manage those threats, right? So, yeah, it's jumping. So as usual, uh, everything has two sides, right? There is a good side, there is a bad side. And with cyber security, uh, the, uh, let's uh, talk about the bad side, that is like the attacker point of view, right? So uh, in cyber security, attackers are the ones that are actively trying to, uh, you know, do some, uh, they act with certain malicious intent, right? And the goal for them is to cause you some harm or do some damages, right? And the other side of the coin is the defensive perspective, right? Where we try to negate those attacks, where we try to put in defenses, policies, maybe checks, and all those things that we together put to create a system which tries to defend those, uh, you know, uh, those attacks. And uh, I think this, uh, all of us know, right, the security is strong as it's the weakest link, right? So there is a big chain, and if the chain in middle has some fault, then it no longer protects, right? It no longer does the job. So for, for a defender, the challenge becomes much more complex because he needs to protect not one single aspect, but overall aspect, right, of whatever they are trying to protect. And for attacker, it's just like, you know, they have focus with a one specific mindset that I just break this chain here uh, and that's it, right? They just have to do that. Whereas the defender need to look at the chain, where is it located, and various and number factors, right? So let's uh, jump in more towards the attacker's overview of the field. Now, uh, you know, attackers, whom do we uh, mean by when we say at an attacker, right? Who is a threat actor, right? And there are multiple variations of threat actors or we can, uh, you know, categorize them into various categories like we have here. They could be uh, cyber criminals who are, you know, motivated by finance. The financial, they have like a financial motivation. They want to earn money out of it, right? Uh, think of like uh, ransomware groups, right? The sole motivation for them is to gain some money out of it. Right? So those are cyber criminals. Now there is another uh, section of attackers, those are like activists. Uh, you can think of like anonymous as uh, an activist uh, threat actor. They are not mo motivated as much as by money, but they are motivated by philosophical and political agenda. Right? They want to bring forward some points or way of thinking. Right? Then we have right now what we see in the industry or what is being seen in the world or in the cyber domain is the rise of uh, nation states backed threat actors, right? And these are no more like, uh, you know, petty cyber criminals or maybe organized activists, but these are much more professionals, they are much more, they have like an entire R&D division just to develop new at attacks and threats and vulnerabilities, right? So th there is now the rise of nation states backed uh, uh, threat actors, right? And the mode, uh, or the motivation, why do they want to do it? is basically to gain political advantage and also spy on stuff, espionage and all, right? And then fourthly, we have the script kiddies uh, who lack in technical knowledge, but they are, let's say, creative, and they use existing tools to piece out information from here and there, and then try to create something, and then maybe they do it for fun, or they do it for money, you know, so, so that those are the four kind of categories where the trade actors will be divided, right? Now, coming to how, how does an attacker attack you, right? Now, uh, uh, the, the cyber ecosystem that we need to protect, it consists of various types of domains, right? One domain is your network, other is your communication, other is, let's say, in the physical access, the other is in the cloud, IoT. There, there are, this is a, in multiple dimensions, right? And, and an attacker, if he needs to attack, what does he, he or she uses, right? So if it's network, 
then what an attacker does is they modify the packets that go on the wire, right? Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if you guys have uh, played around with Wiresar or uh, BetterCap or EtherCap. So those kind of tools allow us to visualize those network packets, right? What what gets transmitted, right? Uh, 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 how the internet exchanges happen, it's all ones and zeros, right? But it's organized in such a way that it, it, it creates a meaning to the receiver end, right? They understand that ones and zeros in some particular way. Now the job of the attacker is there and goes and then try to manipulate those ones and zeros. So let's say if an attacker is trying to, uh, they need to send a GET request in an HTTP server, they, they would, you know, uh, maybe do a man in the middle attack between the network, there are client and server, and then the attacker sits in the between, he intercepts the packets, changes them on the wire, and then sends it back to the receiver, right? Now, this is how the attackers do on network, right? Now, we come to the communication aspect. How does the attacker misuse communication environment is usually with emails, like the phishing scams, uh, you know, and phishing has right now more evolved into spear phishing, which is like much more pointed and much more tight targeted, right? So they do not target like a general audience, uh, audience like saying that you have won a lottery for so and so, give me some money, I'll, I'll give you the rest of it, right? Those are old kind of scams, now it's more, you know, targeted, they know who you are, what you do, what you like, you know, where, uh, where do you work, they know everything, they have done their research, and then they target just you, right? They have created the entire attack pipeline in back of their mind just for targeting you, right? So that's where the industry is moving towards, right? Spear phishing. And then we have physical access. So obviously giving physical access to your laptops and computers is definitely, uh, you know, a bad thing and not supposed to be done. But even within this close vicinity, right? I have my laptop running there. Someone may be using a laptop over there and they may be trying to attack, actively attack my laptop here, right? We know about the WPA, WPA2 Wi-Fi cracking. <coughs> we know about art spoofing in the local network. So all of those that can be done, and that that is known, right? And that alpha card over there, that's one of the good cards that the attackers use because it's powerful enough to generate wide variety of frequencies. <coughs> anyway, I just talk briefly about rubber ducky. So just trying to give you or paint you a picture of what's there in the market, right? So rubber ducky, the the image that you see over there, it looks like a pen drive. But it acts like a pen drive, but it's not a pen drive, right? It's a programmable, uh, let's say, uh, CPU, right? And it executes its own set of instructions. So as soon as you plug in that USB device, it starts uh, maybe installing malware, downloading software, uh, maybe starts recording your keystrokes, key logging, anything is possible. You just need to program it, right? And people have used this to hack various industries and all, right? And then we come to radio frequency in the local range or in the physical networks. Uh, like uh, tools like SDRs or software defined radios, those could be manipulated, right? Like, uh, for example, I have a car, I press the on off button in my, uh, you know, the keychain for opening the car, and it transmits a Bluetooth or a low energy BLE signal over the wire or over the network to the car, right? And then the car processes that information and then opens the door for you or unlocks the engine, right? Now, an attacker who is there who recorded that can replay back, right? It's like just a frequency, right? If I emit that same frequency after some time, maybe the door will open. And such attacks ha has been ha ha uh, has happened, right? We can follow the news, see that Tesla <laughs> were hacked, or uh, you know, n number of products from n different like vendors they have been cracked, or by just by replaying the package, right? So th this is what an attacker could use, right? And then we come to endpoint. Endpoint basically means uh, any uh, end device that does a computation be it your mobile phone, be it laptop, be it IoT device, anything. Those are endpoints, right? And how an attacker uh, exploits those endpoints is through malware, <laughs> is through botnets, right? They, they take control of those, like even this AC, right? It's maybe running a Linux program or maybe, uh, let's simplify it a bit, maybe it's running a Raspberry Pi, okay, right? And that means that it's running Raspberry Pi with Linux installed. Maybe I could control this AC, right? And instead of, uh, it will do the normal function, but apart from that, maybe it's also doing denial of service against some, let's say, uh, some services or some something like that, right? So those are all possible, right? And third actors have been doing that. There have been news of exploiting, let's say, uh, cameras that we have, IoT uh, of devices, and those have been exploited to, you know, do all kind of malicious apps. And nowadays, the attackers, they have evolved a bit, 
and they have started uh, using on or relying on what is called lolbas or living of the land binaries. <coughs> so they do not create malicious programs themselves, but they use existing programs which is already present in the computer to try to you know uh, um, match and create a chain which works, right? So it's not something malicious that's upfront, but if you combine enough pieces together of good software, then you end up uh, in uh, you know executing something that is bad, right? To give you an example, um, power cell, right? It's, uh, or maybe curl. That those are tools that are installed in most every operating systems, right? So attackers can now misuse those to maybe download binaries of the internet. Maybe they can use it to uh, escalate their privileges, so on and so forth. Always possible, you know, with uh, using existing tools, right? They do not have to create something new, malicious, no more. They can use the existing tools. Finally, we come to the cloud infrastructure. Now, cloud is a bit different. In cloud, or an attacker, they need to think different, right? With cloud comes the thing of like mass computation. So, in order to handle mass computation, what happens? There are policies, there are, uh, let's say, keys, there are shared resources. If you create one EC2 instance, let's say, in AWS or in a cloud infrastructure, then that particular server is shared with others also, right? So, that the, the attackers have now started to misuse those. Uh, any questions? I can pause here. So, moving to the next section, how does a cyber attack actually happen? Till now, we have looked at what is the motivation, right? What are the different, uh, uh, let's say, domains from which they can attack us? Now, let's look at how an actual cyber attack happens, right? So, there is something called a cyber kill chain which uh, is generally followed by attackers. It's a seven step process. So the first step is reconnaissance. That means that we, uh, you know, understand which, who want, who we, whom we want to target, right? That is recon phase, where we are trying to gather information of the thing that we are trying to attack, right? Then comes weaponization. So uh, let's say uh, I recon this uh, conference, right? And then maybe I get to know that this conference is uh, maybe the web server that is hosting this conference is internally using Java. Then I know that uh, uh, you know the, the web, this, this is the web conference that I want to target. The server that they are running on internally uses Java. So I then I try to create a weapon which targets this particular thing, right? Then next comes delivery, right? Now I have created a malicious thing. Now I need to send it to you, right? And uh, someone needs to click it or you know open it. And how do we do that? What are the different aspects of the delivery mechanism is being all handled in this delivery phase, right? Maybe they send you an SMS, maybe a WhatsApp, text, you know, and you click on it, and then you know the malware downloads, right? And then when you click on it, what happens? Exploitation happens, right? What do we mean by exploitation? Exploitation is the act of misusing that vulnerable piece of software, right? The vulnerability lies, I have created a weapon for it, I have delivered to you. Now when you open it, it needs to exploit or it needs to take care, uh, make use of the vulnerability in the existing system to, you know, detonate it, right? That is what exploitation is. After exploitation comes the phase of installation. Now, <coughs> the actual uh, malicious thing is happening. So the exploitation maybe is just uh, deployed, let's say, 1 or 2 KB or let's say 40 KB of payload, right? That, <coughs> because I cannot deliver a big payload over an email or over a limited communication channel, right? That is like what we call like stagers. Those gets deployed. Now the stagers will talk to some servers out there and then try to install <laughs> a bigger malware, right? That we call like a stage payload delivery, right? Uh, that happens in this installation process where basically your computer or your endpoint device is getting infected with the malware, right? Now comes the uh, thing about command and control. Now the, the malware is installed on your system. Does it activate it directly? It may not, right? It may in certain cases, it may not. There may be a time bomb so that, you know, on such and such a date, I will activate, right? Or maybe after five days of being installed, I will activate, right? They do all these kind of things because uh, if you look at the other side, the defenders, they also try to take such malicious things and then, uh, you know, they have a, like, let's say, a separate laptop or a sandbox and they deploy the malware there, right? And they try to notice the behavior. But no one waits for five days, right? Just sitting idly just for a malware to detonate, right? So those attackers, they try to take 
advantage of those kind of situations, right? That's why they have a backlinking challenge to a communication C2 server, right? And one more benefit of C2 server is uh, action on objectives. That is, the C2 server can tell the malware how to act and when, right? Depending upon the situation, maybe I need keystrokes now, maybe I need to access the camera now, depending upon that, the C2 communication uh, actions and objectives happen, right? Now, let me quickly uh, show you like the uh, uh, two aspects of this. We have the red team here. Red, red is like dangerous, so that's usually in the industry associated with attackers. And blue, on the uh, on the other hand, is kind of neutral and it's uh, you know associated with the defenders, right? So on the red team side, whenever someone is doing a recon or whenever they are trying to search, then on the blue team side, what we need to do is we need to protect. How do we protect? We need to protect by visualizing what are the incoming packets or what whatever is happening in the network, right? We first need to visualize, right? In weaponization, delivery, and exploitation can all be merged towards exploitation. That's the single uh, simplified stage, right? And for the blue team or the defender side, their job is to detect, deny, and disrupt, or you know, to protect, right? We will see how they do that. And then we have command and control and objective on target, which means persistence on that system, right? And what it means for the defender is to contain that. So the malware has already infected. The best that you can do now is not let it spread, right, and infect others, right? Okay. Uh, I know if the text is readable, this is an image, but uh, still I uh, try to present you this micro attack framework. I know sure how many of you are aware of it. Uh, even if you are, then I just would like to you know talk a bit about it. So of all the possible techniques, tactics, and procedures that the attacker can use, it is all tied in this micro attack framework, right? So if an attacker tries to do let's say, uh, record, right? How do they do that? They search cloud sources, right? So whatever the attacker can do, it is all, you know, mentioned in this attack framework that Michael provides, okay? Now, um, uh, let's, now, now this is the framework for attackers, right? What about the defenders now? Uh, do they sit idle? No. They also have a framework in place where they are trying to actively protect. And how do they, they do that? They have majorly like hardening, Right? That means you make yourself strong, you uh, you know put bandages, you block off uh, any incoming viruses or uh, malware, right? That is the hardening. That means you make your software hard for the attackers to get it, right? That's the first phase. Then the other one is, even if you have made your software hard or unpractical, right? There are still chances, there is no 100% guarantee that it will work. There are still chances that a malicious actor may get through. And in that phase, the detection uh, kind of comes into. We need to detect those, right? And then once we detect, we need to isolate it, right? We need to separate it from the rest of the system so that we can better understand it. Once we isolate it, we need to deceive it. We need to still think that, you know, uh, it's achieving its goal, but we are mainly trying to understand how it works so that we can be better prepared for the next wave of attacks, right? We have received and then we have kivik. Kivik basically means to you know kick out the malware or bad actors from your system, right? Now, mm, as one aspect of hardening could be like multi-factor authentication uh, that's written there, uh, MFA, right? And then the other one is one-time passwords, which generally most of the uh, you know software that we use or web services we have used try to uh, uh, include those, right? Those comes under to give an idea comes under hardening, right? For um, uh, uh, file hashing, uh, URL, uh, you know the server is trying to download it from some malicious URL. So those kind of scans are also part of that. Now coming to detection, in detection we try to, the malware is already there and it's doing something, <coughs> right? Uh, so we need to detect it. How do we need to detect it? Maybe, uh, you know, system calls, sys calls, right? That is like a, uh, what, uh, what the software sends to the operating system to do some basic actions, right? Without syscalls, files cannot be open, read, write, anything, right? So we, let's say we monitor those syscalls, right? And then try to identify if there is something malicious happening. Else. That's all part of the detection, right? <coughs> Isolation is like, uh, you know, there are like mandatory access control, which are like talks about label-wise control of secrecy, forward secrecy, reverse secrecy, and those kind of stuff, right? And then we have deceive. One interesting aspect of deceive is honeypots. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about Honeypot or used one. A Honeypot is a system where we have, let's say, specifically created so the attackers comes and attack us, right? And in Keysight and in ATI, the work that I do, 
is to try to, you know, we, we look at those honeypot data, try to see what the attackers are attacking us with, and then try to understand how they do it, right? <coughs> okay. Uh, so any questions up till now, if you want, have anybody gone to those sites, <coughs> were aware of those sites, <coughs> intuition detection system that you are trying to bring out here, is it it? Yes, we try to show various aspects of even how an idea is. Yeah, I mean, what he is trying to explain to you is that um, there is a framework that defines how attack happens, and there is a framework through which you can protect the you against your attacks. And those uh, sites that he has shown, if you can look in, look up on Google or Google look up, look up those sites, you will find out the details about that. So you can self teach yourself on that framework. So that's <laughs> okay, now uh, coming to that kill chain, right, we talked about <coughs> the major aspect if I have to put what is on one thing that is the vulnerabilities and exploitation. Because without that, the kill chain does not exist. If you don't have a weapon to detonate, you have nothing, right? Everything falls apart. So the main crucial aspect of the entire kill chain is those vulnerabilities and exploitation, right? Other things follow, right? Now let's Jump a bit, dive into, uh, uh, take a dive into vulnerabilities. What do we mean by that? And how does an attacker exploit it, right? So vulnerabilities, they are generally tracked using CVs. Those are common in, let's say, uh, European and uh, even in US. Throughout the world, CV is most common. But, you know, um, uh, it, uh, not all vulnerabilities are tracked with CVs, right? Some countries, they have their own specific databases, like China, which has their own CNBD and uh, CNNBD, so they have their own databases where they are all cataloging the vulnerabilities themselves, right? So, one of the most popular vulnerability that we have seen in 2022, and we are still seeing right now uh, in our honeypots is the log 4 j vulnerability, right? And this, too, this is a graph, year is November, year is December. So, on November of last year, we saw zero hits, right, in our honeypot. We see more exploitation attempts of that because that was not announced, right? In December, it was announced. The vulnerability was released to the world, and as soon as it was released, we see a huge spike in our honeypots against that vulnerability, right? So attackers they are very quick to adapt, right? Something new comes out, they take full advantage of it. Now, as defenders, do we sit idle? No, we cannot, right? We are, we need to be always on one step ahead or one step back, but we need always be on the running race, right? We need to be, it's always a cat and mouse game, but either when we are forward or either they are forward, right? That's how the industry progresses. Now, on December, we see a huge spike and then it got down, maybe because the defensive protections or patches were installed that resulted in decrease in those vulnerabilities, right? Now, this specific vulnerability was exploited by, you know, multiple malware families, including the Mirai um, and XM Read, that's like a cryptocurrency miner or malware. And it was also exploited by very threat actors like uh, even like tied to energetic beers, uh, APT19, APT41, you know, those are like nation states um, um, uh, backed threat actors. Even they use this vulnerability. Now, if you will ask me what was the vulnerability, and then I'll see, I'll point you just to that one line, right? That small line of code that you see there, uh, black, uh, the <laughs> dollar sign traces, J and J, and F, S, 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 something, that single one line, right, was able to take down the entire infrastructure. That was the vulnerability, or that was how, or what the attacker said to exploit it, right? So let's have a quick demo on, uh, on that. Um, Okay. So what I have here is a Linux terminal shell, right? Um, and then let me. So what I'm doing right now is running a Docker container, which contains the vulnerable Java software installed. Okay, that is what is happening here. The container has started. The Java server is up. Now let me. In order to exploit this vulnerability, I need to be sending something, right? And I also need to be listening back right so let let's, let me start the uh, let me start a script which basically starts a web server or a loop uh, or a listener and then let me also start a listener which is like this will listen to the reverse shell right 
So what it means right now, what, what is happening here, let me try to paint the picture. This is the vulnerability software that <coughs> has been brought up using Docker, right? Uh, containerized. It's a running a web server, Tomcat, and it has Java, uh, you know, uh, logging libraries present, right? Now here, what I'm doing is I'm starting a LDAP server because the vulnerability needs to talk back to a server, LDAP, DNS, or anything to be able to send you that malicious payload, right? That malicious thing that, that it needs to send. So that's why we are starting the, that here. And it tells me that send me this command, right? So as I showed you earlier, it's just a single line of command, right? That I need to send for the vulnerability to happen. And what I have running here is I am having a netcat, NC stands for netcat, listening mode, right? And I'm listening on port 9001 for any active incoming connections back to me, right? Uh, for the purpose of the demo, it's both are in the same system, but it is dockerized. But you can think of like, you know, this is a separate system. The vulnerable software is running somewhere else, right? Let me start the listener. And let me copy paste the exploit that I need to send, right? This is just the exploit that I need to send. Uh, there is this. Uh, okay. so, so this is the web server that was started, right? Uh, by the uh, Docker container, it's like a generic web page that you might also be accessing, right? Now, let's type uh, admin admin. That's one of the most common passwords or username password. He says it says that the password you entered was invalid. We will log your information, right? So we will log your information. That night, that means that they are using some form of logging library, right? And that logging library now could be log for j, which we want to exploit, right? Now let me try again with the exploit. Okay, so and I am just pressing enter here to show you that there is no uh, callback happened right now, right? I have not gotten the reverse shell yet, right? Now let me. So go. when he logged in, so if it was way. allowed, then you would have seen something coming up over here because it is listening, listening to the incoming connection, right? So he tried to log in. He didn't allow him to log in. That's why he didn't get anything in the shell. That's what he's trying to explain. Got it? So the vulnerability has not been exploited, right? Yeah, yeah. That's why I did not get anything back. So even you tried to log in, since he didn't allow to log in because admin admin was not valid, he didn't get any prompt back because he's listening to any connections coming to him. Now he will show that by that vulnerability, it will induce a uh, means a response here. So you just show that. Let me uh, paste the vulnerability that I just copied. Let me give the password as admin again. So, see, connection received, right? So, I have received the connection. This is the vulnerable software. It says error and then log for j. It has logged that error. It has logged my password. So, this was the previous one. It has logged my username, right? In, in this case, it is now logging the log for j vulnerability, right? We don't see it here because I am still in the reverse side, right? Now, what happened over here? is that I was listening to that LDAP server, right? So that I could send my exploit. <coughs> that actually looked at it and it sent that exploit back, right? That's why I've got a reverse shell back. Let me type ID here if I have really got a reverse shell. See, I have got an access to the Docker container. Now I can do who am I and then it says I am root, right? So I have exploited the Docker container or the server that was running this vulnerability. And it was so easy, right? Just that one specific command, right? And this vulnerability really created a headache in the industry because even in iPhones, right, if you change your iPhone name to this kind of string, it actually triggered this vulnerability, right? And that was just one example, right? And this was used everywhere. This in Java is used by so many softwares uh, and products, right? This this vulnerability was widespread in the industry, right? Now so let's see if I can access cat password. Yep, I get it, right? So I have full control of that Docker container as root, right? You have unauthorized access, you get the point, right? Because log4j was logging, he was able to use that command to get him access into that server. Now remember, just think if it's a, I don't know, if it's a banking server, what can happen? So that's what he's, he's giving again. It's a, it's a, it's an actual process how a hacker does. Nothing theoretical about it. Any questions here? Any questions? Still not understanding how much of you are following the internet. Are you guys following this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
ask questions if you don't follow. No? Yeah, ask we are trying to make it as light as possible. We cannot hack everything. Right? This is actually, you know, the life thing, you know, you people uh, cannot kind of think that, you know, it, it's so simple to do a hacking, you know, this is how this uh, actual hacking happens, how this listening is done and how they are exploiting these vulnerabilities. Please go through it, you know, uh, these are actual practical things, hands-on things. And, and just to continue what Sir said, like, there are complex layers, right? Attacker just send that uh, single string, but what is happening in the background is all this, right? And that is where the defender mindset needs to kick in now, right? Now the defender needs to think like an attacker first. He has attacked the system. He knows it could be exploited. Now is the defender has to think like a defender. Where can I put my security checks, policies, or softwares in place so that this attack does not happen, right? So we have an attacker who sends that get request, right? That was basically admin has been using a password that got through as a get request to the server. When this was being transmitted to the server, the defender could have noted the packets that were transmitted with, uh, as a firewall or as an IDS or an, as an IPS devices, right? They can look at those incoming packets on the wire and then try to see if that JNDI thing was there, right? If a JNDI string is there, then most likely the exploitation of this vulnerability is happening, right? So a defender can try to detect it here, right? Now, on the other hand, on the vulnerable software itself, there is this application which is internally using that log4j library, right? And it tries to write to a log file. When it does write to a log file, then it must be using system calls, it must be doing some form of file write, right? Then the attack, uh, then the defender can, you know, if it's a endpoint uh, detection EDR tools that are there out, on top, they try to look at those, right? So uh, the antiviruses, maybe they look at file writes and see if that string is being written to. If the string is being written to a file or to a logging mechanism, then most likely the exploitation is happening, right? So defender needs to think a bit differently now, right? Now, this application might directly be writing to a log file or it may be using another application internally which is again writing to the log file but the process remains the same, right? When it does write to a log file, what happened was a request was sent back to the ITAP server that we were running, right? Right now, till now, the exploitation of the reverse cell has not happened, right? It sends back an ITAP request to the server or to an attacker machine. Now what the attacker machine does, it, it crafts a Java serialized payload because that Java framework is being exploited, right? So it creates that uh, malicious serialized payload and sends it over on the wire again to the vulnerable software. Now the defender can look at this packet. Right now the string is no more there. The JNDI thing has gone, right? In the wire we don't have that. We have some Java serialized payload. Now the defender can look at that and try to get a context. If the previous request was like JNDI and now I am seeing a, <coughs> excuse me, a Java serialized payload, then most likely exploitation is happening, right? This is third. Now when this when this gets executed, again the defender can kick in and see if that is doing anything bad, right? And finally, as I showed you in the demo, it created a reverse shell, like the malicious code got executed and then I got a reverse shell back, right? Where I could do C and CNC objectives, right? I could tell it to print me the cat it is a password file or maybe tell who am I as root and those kind of stuff, right? Any questions here with respect to this slide? No? Sir, yeah. when it was sending the pa request back to from the server, from the log 4 server back to the bash, where you were receiving the... The reverse end? Yes. Oh. What if we, uh, what if we, so what if we, uh, in the reverse uh, packet, if we use, remove the message, uh, log message functionality in order to remove the, uh, you know, it's, it's like if there's a percent M message uh, vulnerability, I was just reading about it. It's like, uh, Modify all log statement formats in the application to percent %m to remove the message lookup feature. Uh -huh. So that way, one cannot uh, receive the right. vulnerability. So does it work? No, uh, it's not receive the vulnerability. 
It's right. It does not do message lookup. That means it will not do this callback to that LDAP server, mm -hmm. right? Whatever was inside that dollar JNDI, mm -hmm. JNDI stands for reverse message lookup, and it was using LDAP or maybe DNS or HTTP to get that. It's a communication protocol that it establishes, right? Mm -hmm. When you use this modulus M or whatever you talked about, that disables the log4j feature of doing a reverse lookup. So that is part of the hardening thing that we all earlier looked on, right? One stuff to protect yourself against this kind of attacks is to harden yourself. How can you harden yourself? By following this kind of patches or by following this kind of, uh, you know, uh, suggestion. Right? Also, sir, can this be avoided by isolating the system, for example, virtualizing the uh, separate files? So, uh, no, I, I mean, I just showed you inside a Docker container, right, which was running inside a VM. So it was already isolated. By that, what I can do is I can control the extent of this vulnerability of how much it can interact with others. Like the, uh, I got a full root shell access inside a Docker container, right? I did not have it on the VM. I did not have it even on the running on the host machine that is my Mac, right? But uh, there can be other vulnerabilities that are there in the Docker containers that the attacker can exploit next to gain a privileged privilege shell or do a sandbox escape and then come out of it, right? So even if you isolate it with like VMs and Docker, there is still a chances that the attacker will go. You can do definitely do network segmentations and those so that you you know segregate the network so there is no communication from that network, right? Network segmentation helps, right? That's why we see that you know things are divided now. Yes, thank you. Uh, anything else? Yes. So uh, are you using? Defenders, they have caught up to him or caught up to the attacker by looking at the JNDI. So now the defender thinks that if I see this string JNDI together, it means the exploitation is happening, let me drop that packet or let me block it, right? Now the attacker has now knows about this and gives one more step ahead, right? What he does next is instead of sending JNDI together, he maybe sends it using lower upper, lower upper case within the Java specifications, right? So what he has done here, the attack, uh, the defender is looking for JNDI. Now the string is no more JNDI. It is like minus J and D I or some some other variations of it, right? So what the attacker has now done is he has evaded the defenses that were put in place, right? And that is what happens in real world in industry. We see a kind of attack happening today. The very next day or the very next hour, it has evolved into something new. The attackers have found way to build the system, right? And and there are multiple variations of this attack not just this one, like instead of using LDP, I could be using any other protocol, uh, and so on. <coughs> now, coming to other interesting aspects of the cyber uh, security is malware, right? Uh, and, and they are everywhere, right? And um, uh, what do we mean by a malware? Malicious, uh, malware stands for malicious code, right? It could also be a Word document, it could be anything, right? It need not be an executable, right? Or an EXC or a PE file or a DLL file, it should not be that, it can be a word document, right? It can be anything. That may cause harm is a malware, right? And malware were there, right? Malware were there and again defenders put in checks by let's say a malware, if you take a file and then do a hash, like let's say MD5 or SHA1 hash, what do you get? You get a small string of, uh, you know, that hash that belongs just to that file, right? So defenders, they started using that hash to detect malicious files on the wire, right? Now, the attacker saw that and then they came up with polymorphic malware, which means the hash is no, now no more the same. It always changes, right? And they, they evade those detections put in place, right? And then uh, the, uh, the uh, defensive side, they also try to look at that and then come up with some mechanisms. Then it evolved to metamorphic malware. 
metamorphic malware are malware that self mutate right the executable does not have the malicious code or it has a code which mutates itself right so it's always changing per execution right so the malware that you analyze back then is now no more the same it's it's completely different it's rewritten itself right those kind of metamorphic malware also we see now all of these are malware which are actually files right those are files on your disk so that an antivirus can look at that and then scan it and then analyze it right now the attackers what they have moved on to is file based malware where the file is no more there right the malicious thing is just in the memory it's there in the ram right it is no, not in the disk so your traditional tools does not work here because you are scanning files which are malicious the file does not exist anymore it's just there in the memory and uh, you know malicious uh, threat actors are using this kind of concepts to uh, execute right Uh, coming to a very interesting uh, topic within the malware domain is ransomware, right? Uh, I'm I'm sure that most of uh, us are familiar with ransomware, especially the one I try one because that really exploited the return of blue and the uh, SMB vulnerability, right? Now, <coughs> ransomware can be grouped into four categories right now, but this may change as the industry progresses. Right now, we see crypto ransomware. The basic goal is they will encrypt, ask you for money, right? And ransomware existed before crypto right but why did it took off why did ransomware suddenly saw rise in this recent years is because of cryptocurrency because previously if i write a malware and then ask you to do a bank transfer to me i am easily caught right you know you know my address because that those things now what cryptocurrency um, you know a different thing a different revolution in another domain brought you this domain is that Uh, it uh, anonymized those things, right? Now I am untraceable, right? That's why hackers they started to use that, or threat actors started to use that, and then ask ransom payments in cryptocurrencies, right? That's why we see some somewhere happening something in any other field can also affect this, right? Okay, uh, coming to another form of ransomware that we see in the industry right now is double extortion. So what they are doing? Previous first gen. ransomware they were encrypting your stuff asking for money now they are exfiltrating your data back to somewhere else and then they also encrypt the data there so there is two things that they are doing one is exfiltration and then encryption by exfiltrating they will you know blackmail you saying that hey if you don't give me the ransom payment not only i will not release the decryption key so that you can get your data back but i will also make the data public right and whatever i have whatever intellectual property that you have is now with me i will release it to the public right that's why we call those kind of thing double extortion and right now we are seeing some trends towards it like uh, this maze and ponzi uh, ransomware those are like double uh, extortion type right then we have another one which is very harmful that are like the locker and the viper ransomware right the main goal now is not even to extort you not even to encrypt you what is to destroy your data they encrypt it in such a way that even they cannot decrypt it right and the goal of them is to you know bring down your infrastructure and we had in the industry or in the world we have seen that with the non pitya uh, ransom right so i leave the names here so that you can go back and then google it and then you know understand more then right now the very thing interesting thing that is happening is as a service right software as a service applications as a service cloud as a service infrastructure as a service what so on and so forth so the ransomware groups they have evolved now to provide you ransomware as a service right so you come with me uh, come to me with uh, you know a load of money and then tell me uh, you know give me a ransomware environment right and then i make it for you so now what has happened is this this uh, this intelligence uh, intelligence regarding man, uh, ransomware development this has boiled down to you know more professional work right more r&d focused work because now they are providing services for others to do it it's not now more spread across various things it's like you know as a professional service they even certain uh, ransomware as a service has a customer dedicated customer helpline you know in order to further uh, receive uh, customer email that the ransomware is not working you know we see that uh, trend in the industry right now and uh, the graph here uh, shows the ransomware that we uh, saw in our honeypot right we see see a rise in you know every month this is a activity of 2022 so we see that constantly the attackers are attacking us right okay i'll pause here to take any questions
do it when open, when the Excel gets open, it will download some executables from the internet, right? So the, the chat GPT has written a, a code or a macro which I can embed in an Excel workbook and then send it to you. My job as an attacker has been, you know, streamlined, right? With chat GPT. And it can write various other codes as well to perform all the steps in that uh, uh, cyber fusion, right? From scanning, from writing end map scripts to whatever you want. Now let's look at the other side because there is always the defender, right? The attackers are there, we need to know how they are attacking, then the, then the defenders come into place as well. Now, for defenders, what ChatGPT does really good, it, like if I give it a code, right, and then tell me, I ask it to tell me where is the vulnerability in this, where do you see vulnerability in my code, right? ChatGPT is able then to analyze it and then give it, give it to you, right? For like this example, it gave that you have some flaws, right? The other example that uh, is shown in the screenshot is for reverse engineering of malware, where I do not know how the how the malware works internally, right? Maybe I have used tools like Hydra, uh, Ida Pro, or whatever, right? I have used those tools. I got a code structure, but I can't still make sense of it. What I can do next is put it to ChatGPT and then tell it to explain the code to me, right? And then it does very good, right? It step by step explains to me what the malware is trying to do. So. And then we can use it for identifying vulnerabilities, creating signatures, and all this stuff. Now, what's, what's the potential for ChatGPT? It can create malwares, right? And uh, uh, it can create malwares also in such a way, this is taken from a blog. Uh, it can also create a malware such a way that the malware itself just has a Python interpreter, and it talks to a ChatGPT server to tell it, give me a malicious code, right? So the malicious code is no more no more part of the initial malware, right? It does not have anything malicious in it because it just has a Python interpreter and let's say API calls to chat GPT, right? And if I'm looking at the code, I have no ways to tell that this is malicious, right? What it does, it talks to the chat GPT, gets a malicious thing, and then tries to execute that, validate the syntax, and then execute that, and then it talks to a CNC to achieve its objectives, right? So that is possible, right? And we also see like full keychain implementation, like let's say if I give it enough prompts, like let's say 90 or 100, uh, I'm asking 100 times to chat GPT to write in something, you know, some small pieces of code, right? The phishing email, the uh, the VBA macro, the first stage payload, the second stage payload, and all of those things, or even the C2 communications, all of those things can be, you know, being written by chat GPT. But, you know, a fully functional complex ransomware campaign is still not possible. It still needs, you know, human to, you know, someone with uh, good domain expertise to create it, to piece together those information. But ChatGPT definitely has. Now, what does it all mean, right? We are seeing this, we are seeing this pain, but what does it mean, right? What are the different research opportunities that this presents, right? So, all it boils down to with ChatGPT is are you asking the right questions? Right? If you are not asking the right questions, it does not give the right answers, right? Like how with Google, we have to know how to search. With chat, chat GPT is like, we know how to ask questions, right? So maybe there could be research on this as what are, what is the best optimal way to ask chat GPT, right? And then there are like moderations built into chat GPT right now in the thing that it does not write a malware for you because that is bad, it's unethical, right? But that has been, I would say, as an afterthought it is not part of the AI model itself, right? The AI model can still uh, generate you stuff and hackers are right now selling, selling services that, you know, uh, gives you unrestricted access to chat GPT so that you can create malware and so on. So, yeah, the moderations, how do we put it in the AI model itself, that could be a good research as well, right? And uh, the other, other thing that it points to or uh, Research opportunity is like detection of deep fakes, right? How do we detect what is synthetic, what is chat GPT from what is real, right? Open AI did release a tool to in order to detect some of their content, but this is always expanding, right? This is GPT 3.5, there will be 4, there will be n numbers of things later, right? But how do we detect, right, if it is synthetic or real, right? Those we need to think of. And what this has done is it has really uh, lowered the bar for cyber criminals because they can now easily create stuff and uh, do it, right? And this is a tool which can be used both ways. 
Okay, I'll quickly uh, try to go over the next few slides. What are the key insights that we can take from this presentation is that, uh, or you know, where can you learn more? That might be the thing that is there in the back of your mind, right? Where do I learn more about this stuff? So I would say like, try Hackney is one good resource to practice it. Whatever I sold, whatever demo I sold, don't do it on your production system or in the college network, right? Do create a safe environment, create a sandbox, create a lab network, right? If you don't know, you can reach out to me, I can point you to certain places where you can do that. And Try Hack Me is one good place where you can, you know, practice, right? Or learn about this. <coughs> uh, there are various CTFs or Capture the Flag competitions that are out there, take part in that. There is this uh, open security training tool, it provides good courses, and even you can read our blogs that we publish, right? Uh, we have some blogs on calling what we cyber manual that we published recently. So we are also, you know, trying to research or trying to come up with something, right, in Keysight. And then there is this Keysight University where there are free, free courses available. And finally, you can always definitely ask ChatGPT, right? If we have the tool now, you can ask it to, hey, where can I learn this, right? Or hey, can you tell me more about this, right? Okay, uh, uh, I will leave it here. Uh, I will let this slide running because these are just like, you know, uh, at, least at the end of the day, if you have to take something out of this session, I would suggest let that be this. Try to use better passwords because for the last 20 years, what we have done is we have made it easier for the computer to crack, but for us, very hard to remember, right? With all those hashes and numbers and whatever, right? We have made it harder for us to remember, but easy for the computer to crack. What we should be doing instead is make it easier for us to remember and harder for the computer to crack, right? And I will leave you with this and there is the site called Have I Been Called? Do put your email there to see if you have been exploited or if your email has been leaked, right? <coughs> so, yeah, any questions? Any Keepass is open source. Uh, it has uh, had uh, vulnerability attacks in the past. Like yes, very yes. recently actually. Yes, but you know, of all the open source tools out there, I, I have, that's why I put one pass at the very front because that's what I use personally. Okay. And then that I recommend is Bitwarden. Yes, yes. And then if you can't, you know, put money or buy stuff, Keepass is the next best thing, right? Yeah. Don't use last pass. I mean, I, I, I will not take yeah, names, but yeah. I use GNU pass. Okay. 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 I have seen one pass is good with devices, multiple devices and yeah, all. Yeah, yes, same. I uh, post it on a bit server. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Talking about vulnerabilities, uh, how is Spectre and Meltdown different from the rest of them? Because it uses the hardware exploitation, which is more hard to mitigate as compared to a software uh, exploitation. Right, right. And, and in case of Spectre or uh, Meltdown, it was like bit flipping attack, right? They flip those bits somewhere in the memory, which, you know, on the relative section, and then uh, that changes the bit somewhere, right? And then they were able to do it. So, yeah, it's like with it hardware, it becomes much more difficult for the defenders to do their job because it's very hard, right? And sometimes what we see is, uh, you know, like uh, uh, like car companies, they roll back their uh, cars and devices back, right? With all this autonomous driving and all this stuff. When there is some flaws in the hardware, they want to roll back get it back to the factories, patch it again and then send it back, right? Of course, you can't do that with large scale like semiconductor stuff. That way, it becomes much more challenging for the defenders. But for small case, roll back and then, you know, fix it and then again release it from the industry. So, so till now, there has been not a real solution to these kind of uh, vulnerabilities. Yeah, yeah, because this is hardware, right? If it was software, you could do OTA over the air kind of upgrade patches and release it to the customer so they can download it, right? But for hardware, it really becomes difficult unless you have like a uh, hardware which is more like a software, which is 
generic hardware which you know <coughs> needs the software to run but at the end of the day hardware is the hardware right so after you patch it is there in the device. With, with P4 and others, this will be easier to at least replace the heart. Mm -hmm. yes. Also, sir, with the advent of uh, RISC V, the open source uh, architecture, which is like a uh, mixture between ARM and x86 Intel, it's an open source architecture. So, do you think that with the advent of op uh, being it open source, there will be more vulnerabilities because of it? Have uh, all the source code available to the public? Hackers will be able to use the entire code. So, uh, the way I see it personally is when you open source something, right, it's good because uh, now previously only one eye or two eyes were looking at it, right, but now the entire world is looking at it and they can find vulnerability much more faster, right. If you open source it, then there is definitely more people looking at it and more people can identify. It. So, at the initial release time, there could be more vulnerability that is reported, but that is good, right. You can't be hiding uh, stuff just because you don't open sources because people will actually find a way, right? Hiding is not preventing, right? Yeah, thank you, sir. Any other questions? So was this session informative? Did you guys learn something or? Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to thank uh, Dev Tipta and Achyut uh, who have traveled all the way from Calcutta and delivering this most appropriate and trending uh, you know, <coughs> knowledge that they have shared both. Uh, in fact, in our academics we have seen or we have gone through computer networks. In fact, Achyut, when you were in your 5th, uh, 6th semester, I think I was the one who taught computer networks. So, in our you know, computer networks or maybe network security, cryptographic network security, we have a, you know, we have a, a boundary in terms of uh, the academic uh, discussions that we do in our regular classes. But what we have witnessed today, though I would attend this intermittently because of so many other uh, reasons, but what, what I could see or I could witness is that actually we, you were able to see how the attacking happens or how you can you know how the systems are designed for defending those attacks so in other words anyone who is aspiring to be a cyber security you know uh, specialist in future and where you know it also comes with you know some kind of ethical issues also so means you know whenever you talk about cyber security it should not only be only for this interesting demo and knowledge on uh, cyber attacks, ethical hacking and its prevention and security. May I now please request Mr. Kiran Gautam Sir, <coughs> Department of CSC, to kindly offer our token of gratitude to Mr. Dev Kumar and Mr. Ashut Sharma. <coughs> Thank you.